Anyway, about the background. Well, Fiona said to me, we ought to do something on legal history. We're both interested in that. We've long been interested in that. And we're both associated with the Institute, which is hosting this event. Um, and they're very interested in that. And they've just, you know, got this wonderful archive going um, and, you know, properly funded and so on. And it's got recognition, which is great. So, you know, they're, they're very committed to legal history. So the question was, what will we do? And um, one of the things that, that struck me is there are areas, particularly in more recent history, that just haven't been explored. Um, and which are, of course, of particular interest to me because I'm quite close to those eras. Um, and I, after some discussion anyway, we decided on the 50s because no one ever writes on that. Um, or if they do, it's all on the same thing. Um, and I think not always dealt with very well. And we didn't know what we'd get, did we, Fiona? We honestly didn't know. <laughs> um, we thought no one will, you know, we thought it's possible no one will respond, even though we were interested. But we got this wonderful response right across the board of legal and socio-legal topics. Um, and we do want to put something together, a publication together. Um, which will not be a complete legal history of the 50s, but will be, you know, topics from the 50s that really do need to be looked at, which are fascinating for historians as well as for lawyers, I think. And we were really, really delighted with the response and, and the range of papers. Um, so that was it, basically. Once we decided on that and the title, The Neglected Decade, then the rest, of course, you know about. Um, Right, is there anything else then, Fiona, that you think we ought to say before we start? I don't think so, unless anybody's got any questions. No. <laughs> I think also we would like you to move backwards and forwards um, through the papers if you're not in a, you know, in a panel, not the one you're in a panel for, but if, for, for instance, yours finishes early, do feel free to go over to the other one. Um, mm -hmm. There's the two links you've got there. Um, and do ask questions and do, do I guess what, what's nice if you're studying the same decade is that although what you know about may not be direct, directly related to the topic that's being discussed, because you have background knowledge of the period, then it could actually be quite valuable to share that kind of information. Mm -hmm. um, that's why these sorts of workshops I think are great that are that are linked by a, a common period. So do feel free to speak up and have a proper discussion. I think we will actually, looking at the people who are here, um, you won't need to be um, encouraged actually, but, but please do. So I think we are slightly early, but I think we should probably try and start because it'll take us a few minutes to move into the next session, especially the first time we do it. So, um, Perhaps we should split into the two sessions, Rosemary, and yep. um, start. And yep. so um, let's just check what's going to happen at the coffee break. Um, so there's a break at 11.15, Chetna. And can you leave the Zoom on for that? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so, you know, if you aren't going to have a cup of coffee at 11.15, then, then um, you know, there's a possibility of chatting, which would be quite nice. Yeah, or even if you are having a coffee. <laughs> even if you are having coffee, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to leave this one and I'm tootling into 1B. So see you all there later. Bye-bye. And, Bye. uh, and um, 1A is going to stay on this stream, this link. And maybe we'll give it a couple of minutes. And maybe um, my slides could be loaded up, ready to go. Oh, super, thank you so much. Excellent. In fact, you can go onto the full screen, can't you? I think, or do you do it that way? Yeah, yeah, that's, that looks great. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you everyone who's here. I know Murray's here. I see Helen, hello. Um, John, Gwyn, yes, Tony, great. Okay, lovely to see you all. Oh, hello, Francis. Right. 
Okay, just give it a couple of minutes. Um, I expect some people might join a little bit late, but um, anyway, just I'll just witter on. Um, because um, Fiona and I are organizing this, we're also going to chair um, all the, the panels that we uh, watch. And that for that mean, that means actually I have to chair my own panel, um, which means I have to keep to time. And there's three of us here, so I do have to keep to time. We'll be looking at um, 20 minutes, ideally, um, with questions and discussion afterwards. Um, I'm not sure whether you would like us to do all three together and then have the questions and discussions afterward, or would you like to take each one separately? If anyone would like to express a view, just speak. They're all quite different topics, Rosemary. I wonder if questions after each one might not be a way to go. Just yeah, a suggestion. So. Okay, let's do that. And that means we've got half an hour for each. I think that's right, isn't it? Yep. Um, and we're not going to take any longer than that. So we've got to take time away from anyone else. Okay, so, and then if it's, there's any kind of issue about it, I'll just speak, okay? If any of you, I can't imagine that Helen and Mary will be going over, but if you do, or if I do, just speak, say stop, okay? Right, well, um, shall I start? Um, and uh, is that all right if I start? Yeah? Silence me consent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm doing divorce law reform in the 50s. Just to tell you how I got into this very briefly, I was writing a chapter for a book uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Divorce Reform Act 1969. And I was looking at the feminist input in Parliament uh, and the various debates and how they managed to influence the final um, legislation. And I started in 1951 because there was a bill for divorce law reform then that didn't succeed. And then I discovered I had far too much material. So I then just dealt with the 60s in the chapter I wrote and left the 50s. So that got me into it and it got me interested in it. And when I'd looked at the material, I came up with three research questions, which I'm going to try and answer in this presentation. First of all, why 1951? Um, it's not a question I think that we've seen much discussed. Why by a woman? Um, I did think that was so interesting. I've always thought divorce law reform was something men wanted. Um, and generally it is what they campaign for mostly, but this was proposed by a woman MP. And then finally, why did nothing happen? Um, what happened to it in the ensuing almost 20 years? So what was the proposal? Um, this was a private member's bill by Irene White. Um, and she wanted divorce after seven years of separation. There was no need to have fault. I mean, it's so ironic, isn't it? We've only just got rid of fault um, this year in legislation, but this she was just proposing, okay, you can get divorced after seven years apart. Um, but crucially, I think for this bill, um, it was just on that. It didn't say anything about ancillary relief. It didn't say anything about property division and so on. Um, there were already, um, there was already provision within divorce law for maintenance and so on for ex-wives and children, um, but this was not considered here. So they weren't going to try, try to do anything with this. It was only going to be dealt with after it was passed. Next, please. Um, so the first question, why in 1951? Well, as we all know, during World War II, lots of relationships broke down and the divorce rate rose, but many marriages broke down without divorce um, because the only grounds for divorce were adultery, cruelty, and desertion under the legislation. Um, the last divorce reform was in 1937, so it hadn't actually been that long before. Um, but it meant that if you were just living apart, um, there were no grounds for divorce if you didn't want to do it. Um, and the se second thing was the concern about the large number of unmarried relationships and illegitimate children in an era when these were stigmatized, I mean, they were thought to be, you know, not good things. It's not like today. Next, please. It was framed as pro-marriage and divorce law reform nearly always is, but it was marriage was obviously particularly important in 1950. So the idea was if you had a, an easier divorce law, it would, it would um, enable many people who are already separated and living with new partners um, to marry them. 
and legitimise their children, although that wasn't actually brought in until 1959, the idea that if parents subsequently married, um, their children became legitimate. And here is what Irene White, and I put in there, she was the Labour MP for Flint East. This is what she said. The social purpose of this bill is to meet the situation in which many thousands of men and women are living apart in a state which is not marriage in any full sense of that word, but in which they are unable legally to form another union or to establish a normal home life. The estimates of the number of those separated vary from 100,000 to a much higher figure. And it's quite clear that we have here an important social problem, especially when one takes into account the third parties often involved and the numbers of illegitimate children. Next, please. The real problem was that women were refusing to divorce. So the men were living apart with their new partners and their ex-wives would not divorce them, even though they could for adultery. And this is because they would lose benefits because benefits in the era right up until this period and, and indeed later were premised on their relationship to men. And Mrs. White says, I've been struck by the large number of cases that have come to my attention of the number of women who have grounds for divorce, who are not bringing forward any religiously, and who do not appear to be vengeful or spiteful in the matter, but who frankly say, I am not prepared to divorce my husband. I do not particularly want him to want him tied or to make him unhappy. But if I divorce him, I relinquish my rights to the old age pension or the widow's pension to which I'm entitled by virtue of his contributions. Next, please. Now, what's interesting and not unexpected to those of us who've lived through several of these debates um, over divorce is that women were to blame. Mrs. White again, I have every sympathy with the man or woman who's genuinely wronged, genuinely, and who is left to face the world with a family with, without a partner to whose help he or she is entitled but I have no sympathy whatsoever for the harpies who try to make the most they can out of a broken marriage relationship. It's a little bit shocking to see someone who in other respects was a bit of a feminist to talk about other women as harpies, but there we are. And of course it makes her a woman Labour MP um, come into line with the conservatives who were opposed to divorce law reform. And here's Mr. Lindsay, a man. If we look at the question actuarily, and assume that one or other of the parties is principally responsible when the breakup of a marriage occurs, then in about half the cases, the so-called innocent person in law was either more responsible for the marriage having broken up or took the least trouble to prevent this happening. In other words, even when he went off with a woman, it was actually, you know, partly or largely her fault. Next, please. Labour is interesting. The Conservatives were more or less all. This is, I'm looking at what MPs were saying in the debates. Mr. Wilkes, Labour, Newcastle upon Tyne Central, who's a barrister. I practiced at the bar for only a comparatively small number of years, but it's my experience that in about 85% of cases at least, it's perfectly easy to point to the one spouse who's taken the step which has broken up the marriage. I can only suggest that the philosophy which lies behind much of the talk in support of the bill that there are always faults on both sides and that the, flame, the blame is 50-50 is not proved in my experience. So here's someone who's opposed to divorce law reform and who's saying it's not true uh, that both parties are to blame. But Mr. Weitzman, Labour MP for Hackney North and Stoke Newington in London, I suggest that no practitioner in the divorce courts who's had any considerable experience there can do other than support this measure and support it wholeheartedly. In other words, he's saying it's a good thing. And I think mostly, in fact, the, um, the, the London MPs were in support of it. Perhaps they're a bit more progressive or modern or something. Uh, next slide, please. So as well as women being to, to blame, it's also unfair to men. I mean, this is really quite hard to take, I think. Um, so here's Mrs. White, who's obviously been lobbied. I have in mind the case of a man whose earnings have never been more than five or six pounds a week, but who over a period of years has paid more than 2000 pounds in maintenance to a woman whom he has not seen for 20 years and is never likely to see again. He committed no moral offense beyond making a mistake in his choice of partner. That's very interesting, isn't it? That characterization of marriage, you know, which is meant to be till death 
part. But anyway, through sickness, etc. It's, it's yeah. So making a mistake, so easily forgivable. The result is that she collects a pension for life while keeping him legally tied. He has absolutely no redress unless he chooses perhaps to join the 3,350, I think it was, husbands who went to prison last year because they refused to make these maintenance payments. Next, please. What I think is, to answer the question about why 1951, is as so often the case, Whenever there are gains for women, there is a reaction against it. And I think that men have been lobbying Mrs. White. This is one of the reasons why we have it in 1951. Um, between the wars, actually, it wasn't a terrifically progressive time for women, but you know, there was the extension of the vote and a number of other things. Um, and of course, women were in the workforce and, and gaining a lot of independence during the war. Um, and I think this reform was part of a reaction. Um, and I draw a parallel with the Matrimonial Causes Act 1984, which I don't know if anyone remembers, was the one that uh, brought about the clean break idea in divorce, and which was opposed by an awful lot of women who said, you know, these ex-wives um, aren't really trained to have jobs. They've been in marriages a long time, and yet you're saying they should be cut off after it period of time. Well, it's very clear that they were lobbied by Fathers for Justice and other men's rights groups at the time. Now, one of the gains for women, and this is where as a property lawyer, I can, I can bring this in and, and Helen obviously will know about this too, that Lord Denning in the courts was developing a doctrine of the deserted wife's equity. Um, and there was a deserted wives bill. It didn't get very far in 1950. The deserted wives equity was developed for those women who had no interest in the family home, but whose husbands had left them. The husbands owned the home and they would then sell them. And these deserted wives were left without property. And he was saying, he developed an equity which allowed them to stay in the home and which stopped um, mortgagees or purchasers from getting the property um, without, without um, getting the property with vacant, with vacant possession. So anyway, they were developing, they were of course overturned. This was overturned in the sixties. Next slide, please. I think there's an element of self-interest. Mr. Black, conservative Wimbledon, practically every letter I've received in support of the bill has been from someone with a personal interest in the subject matter of the bill. Whereas nearly every letter I've received against the bill has been from somebody who was actuated by a matter um, of belief or principle in being opposed to the bill. So what we're seeing here, um, is that people supported the bill because they wanted to get a divorce. Next, please. Second question was why a woman? Easier divorce being something that men usually campaign for. Um, I think a better question is why this woman? Why this person? Um, Irene White is an interesting woman. She's, she was educated. Um, she came from a professional political family. Um, she'd been to some, Paul's Girls School and then got a scholarship to Somerville, Oxford. Uh, she was a journalist by profession. She did marry, but relatively late in life when she was 38 and she had no children. <clears throat> and she supported equal rights. We know this because she actually persuaded the Labour Party conference in 1947 to accept the principle of equal rights. And um, what we see here then, next slide, please is uh, a classic equality feminist. Those of you who know anything about 19th, uh, 20th century feminism know that after the uh, First World War, there developed two strands of feminism, I mean, or probably more than that, but two major ones. The ones who are very keen on equality um, and the removal of restrictions on women um, and campaign for equal divorce, equal guardianship of children, equal pay, equal job opportunities. And the others, um, <clears throat> new feminists, they're often called, like Edith Summerskill, another Labour MP, who argued that most women were in fact uh, wives and mothers, they weren't in the workforce. Um, and what they needed was to be empowered through rights for housewives. And uh, just to give a plug for um, Sharon Thompson's wonderful book on the Married Women's Association, which I read recently, that explains Edith Summerskill and the MWA's um, role in 
in campaigning for something called equal marriage, where there was equal financial um, status within the marriage, not just on divorce. So that's a very important other stream. But we see Irene White as being, I think, as an equality feminist, because uh, for her, she's not going to be in a home being a housewife and mother, even though she's married. And so divorce law reform, which swept away restrictions and barriers, uh, was very much in this liberal feminist tradition. And it's also something that Sharon makes very clear in the book is that the Married Women's Property Acts of 1870 and 82 had a kind of iconic status. I mean, nowadays we think, well, you know, they didn't do all that much because most women didn't have any property. Um, so the, it didn't make any sense that they then got the right to have their separate property. But of course, symbolically, what it did was um, it said it, it, it kind of started the end of coverture and the recognition by the law of women as legal agents, as independent people in their own right. And of course, that was very much Mrs. White's agenda too. Next, please. The other part of it, it's the equality feminist bit is one part of Mrs. White. And the other is that she played a really important role in the Labour Party. Um, she was in fact a member of the executive and uh, at one point became um, chair of the Labour Party. So anyway, one of the things that I think whenever they say things like she did, you know, let's get divorce first, as she says in this quote, we ought to settle in our own minds the principle on which marriage and divorce should be settled, and then we can face any economic consequences. Um, the fact that she could say, let's just sort out the divorce law and forget about all those women who get divorced and who end up with, with nothing of their own. That's a classic after the revolution type of argument which you get in socialism and the Labour Party. And I have to say, I think it's possibly we get it even today, um, the notion that other rights, all other rights are more important and women's rights are always on the back burner. So this, this rights, the, the position of these divorced women is something we don't bother about at this point. Okay, next please. I think too though, that equality feminists are normally suspicious of protectionism. It's not just callous disregard um, of other people in a different position because women who have property and, and income of their own are aware that measures like property sharing in marriage, which was promoted by the new feminists, as I said, could be used by men to women's disadvantage. If, for example, wives were forced to share their hard earned money with men who gambled or who'd married them for their money. I mean, that's two social classes there. You've got the working women who work their guts up um, and the men just take the money and uh, because it's theirs and uh, they have a right to it and, and or they would if, the, if we had this legislation. Um, but also rich women who've been married for their money. So they're very, very, they're not keen on sharing. They do actually believe in, in separate property. Okay, next please. Um, and then finally, why did it take so long? Now, um, the original question is why did it have to wait till 69? But I think there's plenty of research on why it happened in 1969. That period, the 60s, has been really well covered with, first of all, the sexual revolution, you know, uh, the, the pill and all of that, the many more relationships, um, sexual relationships outside marriage, rising divorce. Um, the Church of England's paper on putting us under, which you know finally admitted there was a possibility for divorce and the Law Commission report. It's also that the 1960s are seen as a modernizing period. And if you think that we have, first of all, the pill, second, the abortion law reform, third, the homosexual law reform, all in that era. And Leo Absey MP, a prime mover in the la last one of these, but also a prime mover for divorce law reform in the 60s. But crucially, of course, divorce law reform was delayed till the end of the 60s because the new feminists held it back with their insistence on property provision for divorced housewives. So they really did rally in the 60s and put forward the matrimonial property bill, which was in fact debated um, and only withdrawn when the government promised to bring in its own bill. And although the Matrimonial Proceedings and Property Act isn't quite what they wanted, it did at least take account of the position of the divorced woman um, who had made contributions to the household, but, but not property. Next, please. 
So the question is rather, why not in the 50s? Well, first of all, Irene White's bill was withdrawn when the government published, uh, promised a Royal Commission. And the Royal Commission into Marriage and Divorce uh, took place in 52 to 56, reported in 56, and then offered no clear recommendations. It was split. It was, it's been very much condemned, but it's very interesting for the feminist input that you read, particularly from the new feminists. And it really did put women's property rights on the table. The 50s are, of course, a very domestic decade. Those of us who through them will remember. Uh, and certainly our mothers and grandmothers, possibly the most domestic of the 20th century, you really did give up work as a woman uh, when you married or when you had children in almost all cases. Then the divorce rate actually declined. Um, so it seemed not to be such an important problem. We don't have statistics on cohabitation. They've only been gathered relatively recently, in fact. I think it's crucial that the Labour government lost the 1951 election and the Tories came to power uh, for 13 years um, because, as you've seen, the, the, the Tories were almost universally against divorce law reform. Labour was split. I think there was no parliamentary will. Uh, other um, bills attempting to relieve women's financial position failed. But also this strong opposition from two di very different perspectives, and it's that I want to finish with. So can we have the next slide, please? First of all, divorce law reform would destroy marriage. So we've got the, the standard conservative and religious objection. Ronald Bell, who's a wonderful conservative from Buckinghamshire South. This bill, in fact, is going to abolish marriage. If the obje object is to make de facto cohabitation respectable in every case, inevitably the consequence is that marriage becomes a state regulation. A registration of actual concubinage. That's really nice because, of course, as we know, uh, since we had divorce law reform in 1969-70, the divorce rate has increased and the marriage rate has gone down. And the Honourable Richard Wood from Bridlington, who says, well, either with this bill, as I see it, trying to relieve unhappiness, or alternatively, we're trying to strengthen the marriage contract. I don't believe we can do both. He's actually saying it won't strengthen marriage. <clears throat> However much unhappiness we can relieve at the moment, we shall be laying up for ourselves more unhappiness in the future. And we shall be laying up also for ourselves in the future, greater pressure for still easier divorce. So they're both right, of course. Next, please. Um, the other side came from the feminists, the new feminists, and they were saying, Divorce law reform is unfair to the divorced housewives. It would be, they could be divorced against their will, compulsory divorce. It was recognized by conservatives. And here's Miss Hornsby Smith. I, I love her because she really does, she really does care about women. Um, she, although conservative, obviously. I therefore believe that we must carefully protect the middle-aged woman who has devoted herself principally to her household and her children and who may not have maintained the superficial attractiveness, which may still beguile her husband in another direction, um, which is a lovely um, damning of men. Next, please. <coughs> or as men put it, here's Mr. Black again. It is the case of the woman who, who after say 10 years of being thoroughly overworked, immersed in her family and in the drudgery of housework without the slightest aid of modern equipment, has grown drab in looks and whose husband has taken his entertainment and has developed interests outside the home. So far as working class families are concerned, this is a very common phenomenon indeed. So both classes here, middle class and working class women are concerned. Next, please. Mrs. Ganley, as I said, the Labour, the Labour MPs were mostly in support of it. I actually challenge that stereotype. We should remind ourselves that conditions today are very much better for many people than they were in the past. The younger woman today is much better able to maintain herself than she was in the 1930s and a little later on. The economic situation generally is much easier than it was in those days. And such people, although they can claim our sympathy and understanding, are in a much better economic situation than ever. She's basically saying it's young people actually who want divorce and young people usually are in the workplace. 
and it's better for them. And, and to some extent she was right, but I think that's much more true today than it was then. Next, please. Okay, my conclusion. It's a striking lack of concern in Mrs. White's proposal and supporter speeches for the plight of deserted wives. Truly, they hardly mention them. Um, opponents drew attention to the unfairness of these women being left with nothing, um, but, but she did not. And it's an excellent illustration of equality versus protectionist approaches to women's liberation. Next, please. But it raises two, um, two big questions. Um, I, I haven't found out why this is the case. I don't know why Edith Summerskill didn't speak. Um, perhaps they were taken by surprise because she was in parliament at the time. I don't know why she didn't speak up for these women. Um, and of course, as I've said before, we only got no fault divorce this year. Next, please. So the lessons. I think it's really difficult for feminists who are, who are opposed to divorce law reform or to anything. I mean, this is divorce law reform, but it could be any kind of measure. I remember it was the same for me when I was opposed to same-sex marriage. How can you do that in terms that distinguish you from conservative and religious opponents? You know, there's a conservative view that says it's wrong because marriage is great. There are those who say it's wrong because, well, in my case, I was saying marriage isn't great, but in this case, they're saying, because actually um, it's, it's so unfair on women as these things often are. And finally, is it better to work for structural reforms that should benefit women in the long run, but leave many victims of the abandonment of the old regime, okay, than to try uh, to protect those women from being abandoned and so help sustain the unjust and unequal system. And I, I raise this because it's still an issue for those, for family lawyers, for example, who are still arguing that we need to protect poor, unprotected female cohabitants. Um, and the others like equality feminists who are saying, actually we need structural reform so that we don't have any poor, unprotected um, female cohabitants. That's it, thanks very much. I just say it's probably time to go on to the next paper, but if other people have got comments or advice as you can tell I'm still at the beginning of this research I'd really really appreciate it you just email me um, and let me know what your comments your questions are thanks ever so much okay shall we move on then to the second paper in our session which is I think Mary um, okay and she's going to talk about the Life Peerages Act 1958 so Mary are you there so I am here thank you very much Rosemary and I'm sorry to break up those questions which no, no, were no, no, fascinating. I hope we can on. come back and other people have a chance to ask you more at the end. Um, I do have slides so I will try and share my own screen and let's see how that goes. Um, okay right how do I share my screen? <laughs> um, I did send my I did send my PowerPoint on so if it's necessary for somebody else to do it for me hopefully that can happen. Mary, right, right, I've got, it. Just... got yeah. it. Okay. I've got it. I think I've got it anyway. Right, how does that look? Great, that's it. Yes. Can you can you see it and does it look okay? Yeah, we can. It's terrific, thanks. Splendid. Right, fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, right, well, um, I'm delighted to be here uh, to, today to talk to you about the Life Peerages Act 1958. Um, and uh, perhaps in contrast to Rosemary, whose research is brand new and exciting, this is actually uh, research I did back in 2008 for the 50th anniversary of the Act and then refreshed in 2018 for the 60th anniversary of the Act. So we're now coming up to the 65th uh, uh, anniversary, so I'm pleased to be revisiting it again. So on the 4th of November 1958, Baroness Elliot of Harwood stood up to make her maiden speech in the House of Lords, commenting, probably this is the first occasion in 900 years that the voice of a woman has been heard in the deliberation of this House. Elliot was one of four women to take their seats in the laws that year under the Life Peerages Act 1958. Before 1958, women could not sit in the House of Lords. This put the upper house 40 years behind the House of Commons, which had allowed women to sit by the Parliament Qualification of Women Act 1918. The 1958 Act did not bring full equality in the Lords, but is nevertheless of huge legal and constitutional significance. Before 1958, the House of Lords was an almost entirely hereditary body. 
The 1958 Act enabled both women and men to sit because of their own achievements rather than by circumstances of their birth. This paper will reflect on the significance of the Act uh, in relation to House of Lords reform and the inclusion of women. First, it will contextualise with previous efforts to create life peerages for men in relation to the Wensleydale case of 1856. Second, it will contextualise with previous efforts to allow women to sit in the House of Lords, particularly the Rhonda case of 1922. Finally, it will analyse the passage of the 1958 Act, which was passed not with sex equality in mind, but to revitalise a body which had become largely moribund. It will also consider the wider impact of the Act in the 1950s and beyond. First, life peerages. In 1856, the House of Lords was a largely hereditary body. The types of peer there included the Lords Spiritual, 26 bishops and archbishops present since the dissolution of the monasteries in, in, in 1539 and still there today, of course. There were also representative peers for Scotland and Ireland, 16 for Scotland and 28 for Ireland, present since the Acts of Union with those countries. But apart from that, peerages in England and Wales simply passed from father to son or otherwise to male heirs, and this automatically entitled them to sit in the House of Lords. The hereditary nature of the Lords meant that there was a dearth of peers with the skills and training to enable them to sit in judgment in legal cases, which came to the House of Lords on appeal. The judicial work of the Lords had become increasingly professionalised in the first half of the, oh, too far, in the first half of the 19th century, but there were not enough Lords to do the work. Judges could be created as new hereditary peers, but it was generally felt that judges did not usually have the dignity or great wealth and estates that was thought appropriate for a peer at this time. In an attempt to solve this problem, Sir James Park, a senior judge in the Court of the Exchequer, was created Baron Wensleydale for and during the term of his natural life by Palmerston's government in 1856. This was challenged by Lord Lyndhurst, a former Lord Chancellor, and after much debate, the Committee for Privileges found that a life peerage did not entitle Park to sit in the Lords. He was created a hereditary peer instead, and as he did not have sons, the peerage naturally became extinct on his death in 1868. The Wensleydale case demonstrated that although a person could be created a life peer by the Crown, this did not include the right to sit and vote in the Lords. The debate shows much personal and professional resentment at the idea of life peers at this time. Objections included unconstitutionality and fears over swamping the membership of the Lords. The Appellate Jurisdiction Act 1876 subsequently solved the immediate problem by allowing the creation of law lords. Four lords of appeal and ordinary were appointed to sit, in, sit as peers, initially for their duration in office and after 1887 for life. Numbers were increased by subsequent legislation and there were nine law lords by 1947. However, the wider question of life peerages was untouched. Various bills were brought forward over the years, but none passed. The powers of the laws were restricted by the Parliament Acts of 1911 and 1949, which removed the Lord's veto over bills and replaced it with the power of delay. But these acts did not affect the membership of the House. Separate from the question of life peers was the question of women in the Lords. And here I would like to acknowledge the work of Duncan Sutherland, who's done a lot of uh, very valuable research in this area. Many women, of course, played important roles influencing the House of Lords throughout history. Women reigned as queens and played crucial behind the scenes roles as political hostesses. Furthermore, some women were hereditary peers in their own right. Women could succeed to a peerage through a barony by writ, by special remainder, and by succeeding to a Scottish peerage, as Scottish peerages usually specified descent to heirs general of the body um, rather than male. Um, women could also be created life peers, reflecting the wish of the monarch, and notoriously, this was the case of mistresses of some monarchs in the late 19th, 17th and early 18th centuries. However, none of these women were able to sit in the House of Lords. Historical legend told of Anglo-Saxon abbesses who sat, sat in Wittens along, alongside bishops and noblemen. And although such stories cannot be verified, they were taken up as inspirational figures by suffrage campaigners in the early 20th century, as you can see here. Some noble women were also summoned to medieval parliaments where they were represented by proxies. But to all extents and purposes, no woman ever sat, spoke or voted in the House of Lords before 1958. As the battle to get women into the Commons was won in 1918, campaigners turned their attention to the Lords, and the test case that came forward was that of Viscountess Rhonda, Lady Rhonda, Margaret Haig Mackworth, who inherited a peerage from her father, D.A. Thomas. Lady Rhonda would undoubtedly have made a distinctive contribution to the work of the Lords had she been permitted to, 
She was a successful businesswoman in an era where there were few and one of the leading um, feminists of her era in the equal feminist uh, tradition that Rosemary has just uh, been talking about. She founded the Six Point Group and the journal Time and Tide. In her youth, she was a militant suffragette and was jailed for setting fire to a post box. After the death of her father in 1918, Lady Rhonda petitioned to take his seat in the House of Lords in 1919 and brought her case to the House of Lords Committee for Privileges. It reached there in 1922. She based her claim on the Sex Disqualification Removal Act 1919, which stated that a woman will, shall not be disqualified by sex or marriage for the exercise of any public function. The committee initially found in her favour. However, the Lord Chancellor, Lord Birkenhead, then took an interest. The committee was reconvened, stacked with his supporters, and after some stormy proceedings found against her. The argument was that the admission of women to the Lords required legislation that express, expressly permitted it. Therefore, in the aftermath of the Lady Rhonda case, various bills um, enabling hereditary women peers to sit in the Lords were introduced by Viscount Astor, husband of Nancy Astor, the first uh, woman MP to take her seat in the Commons in 1919, of course. Uh, these were private members' bills throughout the 1920s and none proceeded. After the Second World War, a petition on the subject collected 50,000 signatures, but was never actually presented because in the meantime, the House of Lords finally declared itself in favour of admitting women peers in principle, with the motion passed 45 votes to 27 in 1949. No legislation followed, however. The question was caught at that time um, up in wider questions of Lords reform, which led to the Parliament Act of 1949. In the 1950s, this neglected decade that we're talking about today, the two, these two parallel questions of life peerages and women in the laws became combined. And when legislation came in 1958, it was to enable the creation of uh, life peers rather than to admit women as such. Following a previous failed attempt in 1953, the Life Peerages Bill was introduced in 1957 as a relatively straightforward way of solving some of the problems of membership that the House of Lords had during the 1950s. This included very poor attendances, known as the backwardsman, question, backwardsman problem, where large numbers of peers only turned up once in a blue moon to discuss issues of relevance to them, such as hunting. There were also a very small number of opposition peers, this was because Labour politicians were often reluctant to support the hereditary principle by accepting a peerage, meaning the work of opposition in the Lords was undertaken by a very few overworked Labour peers after the Conservative government came in after 1951. As the leader of the House said in the House of Lords, having praised the work of the Labour Lords, we know this is a brave facade and we know that on a small number of noble Lords opposite there is falling a strain which they cannot and should be not asked to carry on much longer and this house is perilously near a breakdown in its machinery. In the Commons, the Home Secretary, Rab Butler, echoed this, saying, we cannot rely solely on the creation of hereditary peerages to provide an adequate field of recruitment to the House of Lords. What we want to do is to enlarge that field and make it possible to offer life peerages to people of distinction in the public service. As that quote shows, it was envisaged that life peers would enhance the prestige of the House of Lords, by broadening its membership to a more varied cross-section of society. And part of this, of course, was the inclusion of women. By now, there was a queen on the throne since the accession of Elizabeth II in 1952. And the inclusion of women in the bill was no longer controversial by 1957. This did not stop a great deal of spleen being vented by a minority of peers who opposed it to the bitter end. Notably, the Earl of, uh, the Earl of Early, who referred to it in parliamentary debate as that most vexatious question, the inclusion of the ladies. Earl Ferrers, who opined, we like women, but we do not like them here. And the Earl of Glasgow, Glasgow, who said, many of us do not want women in this house. We do not want to sit beside them on these benches, nor do we wish to meet them in the library. This is a house of men, a house of lords. We do not wish it to become a house of lords and ladies, reflecting, I think, the gentlemen's club uh, approach to the house of lords that many members shared. In the Commons, opposition was led on rather different grounds by Jenny Lee MP, who declared, I am no more in favour of ladies being members of the House of Lords than men, because I do not believe in the House of Lords. Later in life, she overcame these principles to take her own seat in the Lords as Baroness Lee of Asheridge. The Labour Party more generally opposed the bill as a sham, deflecting wider issues of Lords reform, providing camouflage for a Conservative dominated and still predominantly hereditary House of Lords. Uh, these arguments did not win the bill passed both houses without amendment and achieved royal assent on the 30th of April 1958. So what impact did the 1958 Act have? 
The names of the first life peers were announced on the 24th of July, 10 men and four women. However, the first life peer to be introduced was an 11th man, Lord Parker of Waddington, Sir Hubert Mr. Parker, on taking up the position of Lord Chief Justice in October that year. The first life peer to be created was Lord Fraser of Lonsdale, Sir William Jocelyn Ian Fraser, who had been blinded on active service during the First World War and subsequently worked to promote welfare for blind people and ex-servicemen. Other male life peers created in 1958 included a trade unionist, a colonial governor, governor Edward Shackleton, son of the Antarctic explorer, several Labour politicians, and the well-known Conservative politician Robert Boothby. Four women peers were created in 1958. The first to take her seat in the Lords was Baroness Swanborough, Stella Isaacs, known as Lady Reading from her marriage, founder of the Women's Voluntary Service, which is still remembered as that today. The first woman peer to be created was Baroness Wooten of Abinger. Acknowledged as an expert on sociology, criminology and penal reform, she became an active contributor to the work of the Lords and is remembered for successfully sponsoring Sidney Silverman's bill to abolish capital punishment in 1965 in the House of Lords. She was also the first woman to chair proceedings of the House of Lords as Deputy Speaker. Baroness Elliot of Harwood was the first woman to speak in the Lords, making her maiden speech on the 4th of November 1958 on the Commonwealth. Her interests included prison reform, childcare, consumer affairs and international affairs. The fourth woman peer was Baroness Ravensdale of Kedleston, Irene Curzon. She was made a peer in recognition of her voluntary work with young people. And she wondered what her father, Lord Curzon, would have made of it because after all, he had been president of the National League for Opposing Women's Suffrage. 1958 Act did not give women a position of equality with men in the Lords though, because the position of hereditary women peers, such as Lady Rhonda had been, was unchanged. Lady Rhonda herself died in 1958. Indeed, one of the first women life peers, um, Baroness Ravensdale, just mentioned, was also a hereditary peer in her own right, but unable to sit as such. The principle of admitting hereditary women peers was also agreed in the neglected decade of the 1950s uh, by a division in the Lords on the 21st of January 1959, where it was narrowly carried by 59 votes to 51. However, like life peerages, it was not proceeded with until other Lords reform issues required action. The impetus behind this act, the Peerage Act of 1963, was Tony Benn's fight to renounce his hereditary peerage. The Joint Committee, which considered the matter, took the opportunity to deal with other issues at the same time, including allowing hereditary women peers to sit um, in their own right to sit. By now, this was not controversial and indeed become an embarrassment. It was stopping the UK signing up to the UN Convention on the Political Rights of Women. After the passage of the Peerage Act on the 31st of July 1963, approximately 20 female hereditary peers in their own right became eligible to sit in the House of Lords, and the first to take her seat was Baroness Strange of Knockin later that year. Since 1958, uh, more than 1,500 life peerages have been created, including more than 320 women, or 21% of the total. Studies of the impact of women on the House of Lords have found that despite their small numbers, women have made a considerable work on the work of the Lords in various ways, including as office holders, in attendance and their contribution to debate. No women peers were given government posts in the first decade after the Act, but successive governments gradually then become, became, began to appoint them to ministerial positions. In 1999, the House of Lords Act removed the right of all but 92 hereditary peers to sit and vote in the Lords. This means that the House of Lords today is largely made up of life peers. Today, there are 664 life peers in the House of Lords, of whom 222 are women. There are also five women bishops. Aside from the gender issue, life peerages have enabled a wide range of professions to be represented in the House of Lords and to better reflect the diversity of the country at large, with peers from different minority, ethnic and religious backgrounds, and with various disabilities playing active and informed roles. The 1958 Act was therefore a major stepping stone towards equality in the Lords and also a significant staging post in the history of House, House of Lords reform, which deserves to be better known. Thank you very much. Of Helen and myself, thank you very much for um, this invitation to, to, to speak today. This is a brief outline of what the paper will be about. It's entitled Halfway to Paradise. I'll explain that in the next slide. Along with the history of leasehold enfranchisement, it's a decade of debate, and then we'll, we'll be looking at the 1950 report, um, the white paper of the Liso Committee, uh, Liso Property Temporary Provisions uh, Act of 1951. Then we'll go on to the 1953 white paper, which was debated in the House of Commons. Then we'll move on to part one of the Landlord and Tenant Act of 54, 
and then in 55 we'll end it on um, uh, some further enfranchisement efforts and then uh, to end um, we'll look at the, um, the legacy of the 1950s in respect of this particular topic. So the next slide please. Thank you. So halfway to paradise and um, the 1950s represented a midpoint of debates about resold enfranchisement and in fact the debates themselves started in, in, in the 1880s. The 50s was a decade of regeneration and domesticity. And during this uh, decade, we have the emergence of owner occupation as a policy priority. And um, in the 1951 Conservative Manifesto, it stated that um, in a publicly, in a property owning democracy, the more people who own their homes, the better. And it's a period of tension between state control of resources and the market. And we see in the 50s, the tail end of build, uh, building leases falling in and the emergence of uh, modern long residential uh, leases. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at the brief history of leasehold enfranchisement, as, as I stated, the demand for enfranchisement started in the 1880s. And there were bills, and you can see the dates there, uh, and there were 18 in total. And only the first one uh, came anywhere near to enactment. Why did this happen? Well, it emerged from a national scandal of housing conditions, and its failure had long-term consequences. And uh, a variety of proposed uh, requirements for enfranchisement emerged, which uh, uh, related on the minimum years to run, the length of the original lease, the types of leases, the period of actual occupation. And um, of course, it was a, de a, a delicate subject because of the fact that uh, it, it was proposed that it should be retrospective, and that's obviously used very sparingly. Before moving on, I understand, I, I can see that, may, well, there may well be people here who, who aren't property lawyers. So to understand this, I just want briefly to uh, explain the types of leases there. And as set out in the 1950 white paper, there were two types, basically, building leases, the typical building lease stated in the 1950 white paper is a lease for 99 years under which the lessee pays a ground rent, i.e. a rent fixed by reference to the value of the site at the date of the lease. And the characteristics of this type of lease were, from the lessee's point of view, that the capital outlay undertaken by the lessee secures for him at a ground rent the use of the land and building upon it for a long term of years. And from the freeholder's point of view, that this capital outlay on the part of the lessee enhances the value of the reversion when it ultimately falls in. So in the enfranchisement debates, we're talking about building leases here, not occupational leases. And those are explained as being leases normally consisting of a rack rent, that is a fixed rent by reference to the full annual value of the site and the premises on it. So next slide, please. So the motives for enfranchisement, you, you, you can see them uh, uh, there. I'll just um, summarize them by reference to what's in the 1950 white paper. They said that building leases were conducive to bad building, to deterioration of the property towards the close of the lease and to a want of interest on the part of the occupier in the house he inhabits. And um, one motive was that enfranchisement would give small property proprietors an interest in maintaining and improving their holdings and would encourage in them a sense of civic responsibility and would remove a powerful stimu stimulus to socialism and conditions likely to bring about revolutions. So notwithstanding this reasoning in favour of leasehold enfranchisement, it was the Conservative Party uh, that was against it and the Labour Party which um, supported it. So if we could move to the next slide, please. So objections to enfranchisement, they're, they're, um, they're set out there, interferes with the free exercise and development of capital and property, existing bargains would be upset, and lessees would be able to choose when to benefit from the rise and fall of property prices. And whilst freedom of contract should be subject to public policy, private property should only be taken for the benefit of the community as a whole and on terms of full compensation to the freeholder. So before moving to the bottom slides, the sanctity of contracts, a big thing there. Moving to the bottom slides, it's difficult um, uh, to properly compensate landlords. And if, term, if, and if terms were fair, few leaseholders would desire to enfranchise. Then finally, enfranchisement does not necessarily benefit the actual 
uh, occupiers. And then encapsulating all of that in the 1950 white paper, it says that enfranchisement would arrest the grant of the building lease, which I've explained, and the supply of new houses to the working classes in suburban, suburban areas would be materially checked. So the next slide, please. So what we have opening up here is um, a what's termed here a fearsome moral dualism. Um, it's between the haves and the have-nots, people taking in, in, in entrenched positions. You'll see the reference there to Ponting and Bullows. Emerged as a consequence of the emergence and subsequent failure of the 1884 bill. And uh, they cite, uh, uh, cite as follows, various property interests rallied around aristocratic old land ownership. And this process has been described as constituting a conservative consensus or a reaction to the demand to reform the system of property ownership. And this conservative consensus had long-term consequences, which as they state, not only served to severely restrict the scope of prospective reform, but also crystallized the social forces opposed to reform and in a sharper form as compared to the situation prevailing before the period of political crisis. Um, next slide, please. So now we start uh, the, the series of slides on, on, on the, um, the decade of debate. Um, the report um, was published in June of 1950, and this notes the difficulty of, uh, of, of hearing from tenants owing to their lack of organisation as a class. It concludes only a minority of tenants desire leasehold enfranchisement. There's a long discussion about the difficulties of investigating long-term claims of injustice, and it notes in particular the problems of South Wales and the imminent expiry of local building leases. And um, reflecting on the 20th century social legislation, the, uh, the Social Legislation Committee concluded that there is a weaker case for enfranchisement than it was um, in uh, 1884. Um, the next slide, please. So they said no to enfranchisement. They said, we are satisfied that the typical building lease is by no means the one-sided affair the advocates of enfranchisement assume. And um, going to the third bullet point there, enfranchisement of tenants of premises letter to rack rents was wholly unreasonable and enfranchisement was not in the public interest. There was a discussion about whether there should be a right of first refusal in, 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 in place of enfranchisement. And they said no to that as well, giving a statutory right of first refusal will be out of all proportion to the grievances intended to be redressed. So the debate then moved on to propose actions on security of tenure at the expiry of the lease rather than to giving um, enfranchisement. So if we can move to the next slide, please. But there was a minority report and the minority report was, was written by uh, Lord Ingoy Thomas and, and, and Leslie Hale, two um, Labour um, uh, uh, politicians. And this was the very antithesis to, 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 the, to, to, to the majority report. They rejected the approach based on sanctity of contract and rights of property. They said there is no sanctity of, in a contract which is unjust. We consider that property carries obligations towards the community and that the only justifiable rights of property are those which serve those obligations. This too is a principle that for centuries was unquestionably, unquestionably recognized until the sense of social responsibility and obligation was replaced in the industrial um, uh, revolution by, uh, by ruthless exploitation. And they said, we do not believe that our committee sufficiently appreciate what fierce resentment the history of the building lease has engendered uh, in certain uh, industrial areas. So the next slide, please. So we then move on to um, the, 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 the second of this uh, suite of debates. Um, and there, this was a very heated debate um, concerning the temporary legislation, which was enacted in 1951. And MPs asked the Attorney General if he was aware of the many cases in which leases had fallen in and of leaseholders having been served with notices as trespassers unless they purchased their properties for large sums. As I've mentioned before, there's a split between the Labour and the Conservatives uh, on this issue of enfranchisement. And this is a telling um, uh, uh, statement here by the MP, Mr Derek Walker-Smith. He urged the Attorney, Attorney General to bear in mind how far the statute book has been bedeviled by piecemeal and temporary legislation in regard to landlord and tenant. 
and it, it may be argued that, um, that 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 exists today. So in 1951, there was enacted the Leasehold Property Temporary Provisions Act of 51. This was a standstill piece of legislation, and this was quite complicated. And it provided temporary protection for long leaseholders of dwelling houses, which were to expire within two years after the commencement of the Act. And we found an article in the Modern Law Review of 1951, which says, in the meantime, this branch of the law is further embroiled by another piece of temporary but highly complex legislation. It is indeed testimony to the overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly complicated state to which this branch of the law had been reduced, that in order to afford relief in two relatively limited classes of case, it has proved necessary to produce an act comprising 21 elaborate sections and two schedules uh, extending to 20 pages in the King's printer's um, copy. And this legislation was then um, um, renewed uh, in uh, 1953. So in short, it, it, it gave tenants temporary protection at the end of the leases. It was, as I said, it was a very technical debate and an amendment was introduced, the effect of which was to restrict the extension of long leases, but that amendment was defeated and the measure ultimately went on to deal with um, long leases. And on the 30th of April 1953, there was a lengthy House of, House of Commons debate on leasehold, which led to the 1953 White Paper. Next slide, please. So coming to the, um, the White Paper, a uh, Conservative government had been elected. Uh, the White Paper does not make a decision um, in principle, but supports the majority on the basis uh, of its practical difficulties of enfranchisement. Um, it, um, now, uh, it, uh, the cost of the tenant, so, so the only, only wealthier, um, only the wealthier tenants could benefit. And it says here, in short, the leasehold system uh, has created values which cannot be uh, merely destroyed without uh, all the practical complications which are bound to follow large scale uh, confiscation. And this is the telling comment in response in the House of Co uh, Commons, Ingoy Thomas said, the first line of defence is the question of principle of sanctity of contract of the landlord's right of property, the impropriety of, um, impropriety of uh, compulsory purchase for, the, uh, for private purposes, retrospective legislation. None of these grounds can stand up against the kind of moral fervor that lies behind the demand for leasehold enfranchisement. This is why the government have fallen back to the second line of defense, practical difficulty. And I'll explain some of those points on practical difficulty um, later on. So the uh, next slide, please. So the white paper itself, uh, it supports um, an extension of security of tenure, gets away from uh, enfranchisement. And it said that more good can be done by protecting the right of occupation than by uh, uh, giving a new right of ownership. And fault lines then emerge um, uh, 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 between the conservatives, the labor, the property classes, the non-property classes. But on, with regard to those fault, fault lines, um, not, not every Labour MP uh, uh, agreed on all of this. Um, not every Labour MP supported enfranchisement in the House of uh, Commons debate, leading to the 1953 White Paper. Uh, for instance, the Labour MP for Witness had some strong views. He was against the leasehold system altogether, claiming that property is a national asset, a community asset. He was against enfranchisement on the basis that it only served to break up well-managed well estates, which would be better taken into public ownership rather than they should be split into smaller units, the upkeep of which individual leaseholders could not afford. And another Labour MP, Desmond Donnelly, was against leasehold but supported enfranchisement, pointing to the vested interest of the landed estate in opposing enfranchisement. So if we could then go to the next slide, please. So um, before I go to this slide, if I just explain that on the 27th of January 1954, the Landlord and Tenant Bill was debated in the House of Commons, and Sir David Maxwell Fife stated that the bill contained proposals for permanent legislation to replace the temporary measures which I uh, uh, referred to before in the 1951 Act. 
He went on to say that those temporary measures were extended in 1953, as we've seen, pending the passing of more permanent legislation. And he began by considering part one of the bill, which dealt with ground leases of houses, which did not have the protection of the rent tax, because the rents of most ground leases were both below two thirds of the rateable value. And he set out the reasons elucidated in the white paper why the government was against leasehold enfranchisement. And the practical difficulties, which I've mentioned before, were, and we'll have to deal with these more, <clears throat> uh, uh, particularly when we come to write up the, the, the full paper, the cost of the tenant, fair apportionment, where a variety of properties are concerned, the exclusion of late purchases, the issues which arise where, le where leasehold property is concerned in estates consisting of some, or in some cases, very many houses, and the great reduction in the scope of the scheme by the exclusion of publicly owned estates owned by local authorities, new town corporations and um, uh, crown agencies. And Mr West MP said, we have had many references during this debate to the sanctity of contract. It is clear that those arguments which have become almost traditional in the defence of leasehold and the leasehold system are now disappearing. So um, next slide, please. So there we have the uh, the inroads in, uh, on the sanctity of contract, which uh, which I've mentioned. Um, so the, 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 they were gleefully seized upon by Labour MPs in favour of um, uh, enfranchisement. The proposals involve an, a, a considerable inroad and rightly upon this, this so-called sanctity of contract, which invests with a particular holiness these century old rights. That was the MP Frank, uh, Frank uh, Soskis. Um, he also explained the problem of sanctity of, context, uh, of contract. A house is not a thing which you can do without. If you have a family, you have to have a house. To apply the expression sanctity of contract to a contract which in effect the landlord could impose upon the working man is a mere perversion of language. And this is the problem. And um, the government uh, uh, said it was justified by the government as a need to eradicate uh, an anomaly. And for the Lord Chancellor, he said there could be two neighbours who both rent their property. One of them who holds a rack rent is entitled to the protection of the rent tax and has security of tenure, except as so far as the rent tax may provide means for the landlord to resume possession. The other, who is the holder of a ground lease, is not protected by the rent tax. And although he has just the same need for security of ten tenure, uh, he has not got it. Um, the next slide, please. So, closing down on the, the, the demand for enfranchisement, we, we, we came across um, a nice little summary here from Cheshire, which, which pulls all of this together. The object of the Rent Act, the first of which was passed in 1915, has been to meet the acute housing shortage, which originating in the War of 1914, still persists to a lesser degree at the present day. Although the acts affect about 90% of dwelling houses in England and Wales, they do not apply where the rent is two thirds of the rateable value of the premises, nor do they afford protection at the end of the tenancy to tenants holding under a long lease, such as one for 90, 90, 99 years. These leases usually take the form of a building lease under which the tenant is obliged to erect a house or other structure of a certain value, which of course is lost to him when the contractual tenancy comes to an end. And then we've highlighted this. This Cheshire says this apparent but imaginary grievance led to a political agitation for a system of leasehold enfranchisement, which we've discussed, which would allow the tenant to purchase the freehold at the end of the lease. But the practical objections to this appeared to be so overwhelming to the government that the controversy was finally settled in 1954 by part one of the Landlord and Tenant Act, as amended by the Rent Act of 1957, by which a tenancy exceeding 21 years is automatically continued um, if the tenant so desires. The portion which is uh, been highlighted is, is of interest. This, this statement about apparent but imaginary grievances, we think may be a reference to the fact that leaseholders who were in occupation at the commencement of the tenancy would not be the same as the ones in occupation at the close of the tenancy. Um, next slide, please. And I'm coming to an end now. <clears throat> it's important to end with George Thomas, because he was the architect of the Leasehold Reform Act of uh, 1967. Before re reading this particular slide, um, the Landlord and Tenant Act of 54 did not deal with uh, enfranchisement. 
um, there was a debate on knee sold enfranchisement in the House of Commons on the 18th of March 1955. George Thomas said, and this is a point which um, Helen made in, in, in her comments, I think, um, uh, about um, uh, action groups. He said, in London, there is a very powerful and non-political organisation, the London Leaseholders Association. This movement has been established because throughout London, there is the same burning injustice as that which um, exists in South Wales. So this action group was probably the precursor of several organisations which sprang up afterwards to champion tenants' rights. And this is something that Helen and I want to, to, to look at further. Also, I've been on to Westlaw to see if there are any cases under part one of the Landlord and Tenant Act of 1954, found loads of cases under part two, which deal with business tenancies, couldn't find one under part one. And I think that I've now discovered the reason for this, because under part one, there were no rights capable of protection. And you can see that from this particular slide. Um, George Thomas, obviously, he, he owned a home in Cardiff, held on a 99-year building lease. And uh, he said here that the, the Landlord and Tenant Act um, introduced by the present government last year is quite inadequate to protect the householder from the grasping hands of the fierce uh, of the finance of corporations. When the lease runs out, he is now guaranteed security of tenure at an eccentric at an at an economic rent. From paying a ground rent of six pounds a year, he may well may well find find that he has to pay a rent of sixteen pounds a month. This is not at all an exaggerated illustration. If he cannot afford the rent, the new inflated rent, there is no security for him because he will have to leave. He said the 1954 measure is a landlord's charter. The morality of capitalism apparently discusses human considerations. The human aspect does not seem to count. The, and the fact that family associations with a home mean um, much has not entered into the government's consideration. And then if we could skip the next slide and go to the um, to the final one, because I'll wrap it up now. This is the legacy we think of the 50s. The debate on enfranchisement reflected and entrenched the dualism and party allegiances that were already established. This dualism has prevented any serious progress on the old enfranchisement, but in that decade, uh, and has been a break on it ever since. <laughs> But the problems of leasehold in Welsh mining villages overlooked in the 53 white paper for, um, forced an initial leasehold enfranchisement measures, uh, the, the leasehold reform act of 67. There's clear evidence of leaseholder activism during the 50s, particularly in London, which we would like to explore further. And the move towards owner occupation opens up a fault line for government ready to be exploited by leaseholders, particularly in London. Sorry, I've gone a little bit over. Thank you. Okay, so welcome to this session on uh, the environment. Um, three very interesting looking papers. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing them. So I guess we'll just stick to the order in the um, programme, if that's okay, and uh, start off with you, Sue. So the topic of, of this paper is the Great London Smog of 1952. Um, its consequences and contemporary relevance. Next slide, please. So starting with what it was, what caused it and the consequences. So from the 5th to the 9th of December in 1952, London was smog bound, which was a mixture of fog and pollutants. The triggers were a combination of anticyclonic air, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, and smoke particles caused largely by coal combustion, aggravated by additional fuel burning due to it having been very cold in November and December of 1952. There's also a suggestion that the pollution may have been aggravated by the fact that that year, London had switched from electric trams to diesel buses. In the House of Lords, it was reported that in London alone, 4,000 people died in the fog during December of that year. And it's believed that another thousand deaths were caused in a, a subsequent fog in January um, uh, uh, of the year. And most of these had died from respiratory issues, some with pre-existing conditions, 
but others who had no pre-existing conditions. And as many as 8,000 people may have died in the subsequent months as they uh, went into relapse. In a city tradition, traditionally notorious for its fogs and smogs, it was generally agreed that this was of exceptional severity. Next slide, please. The Great London Smog of 1952 was in many ways not unique. The dangers of air, air pollution were known to the government and various measures had been passed, indicated in this slide, particularly to try and control the nuisance of smoke, which was caused by furnaces and domestic fires, uh, factories, public baths, wash houses and steam vessels on the River Thames. So there had been a series of measures put in place. Um, some transferred enforcement to the police, some to sanitary authorities uh, under the Metropolitan Borough Councils, as they were then. The London County Council had particular powers, which were established in 1889, to act if a borough defaulted on the measures it was meant to be taking. And they had authority to, to intervene in smoke nuisance cases. However, most polluters were able to draw on a defense that the majority of smoke came from domestic houses. There were seven, 700,000 houses in London using open fires rather than from um, industrial or factory uh, furnaces and chimneys. The year after the London smog, the London County uh, Council presented a report dealing, dealing its effects, but there were, was considerable reluctance to pass further legislation, given that these acts were already in place. In fact, Harold Macmillan, who later became Prime Minister, said, I'm not satisfied that further general legislation is needed at present. Despite this kind of opposition, the government decided to commission Sir Hugh Beaver to chair a committee on air pollution. Next slide, please. The Beaver Committee presented two reports, an interim report four months after it was formed in 1953, and then a final report in 1954. The interim report focused on air pollution arising from fuel combustion. And it found, as indicated in this slide, no cure can be found for the heavy smoke pollution of our cities and towns until the domestic chimney is dealt with. In our view, there would be little justification for requiring industry and commerce to take possible measures to prevent smoke, often at considerable expense, if the problem of domestic smoke were not also tackled. It also recommended improving the availability of smokeless fuels. The final 1954 report included recommendations to create smokeless zones and smoke controlled areas where the use of coal would be restricted. It also made provision or, or suggested the provision of grants for the conversion of domestic fires to burn smokeless fuel. Uh, next slide, please. The committee estimated that the smoke, grit, dust and noxious gases emitted into the air from domestic dwellings and industrial plant caused damage to property and other harmful effects to the tune of about £250 million a year. So interestingly, the committee focused not just on the health of the inhabitants of um, some of the major industrial cities, but in order to try and attract um, the support of industrialists, the cost to property, to physical property, um, and the cost of wasted heat through excessive smoke. The committee assessed that wasted heat through the emission of smoke cost about 25 million pounds a year, um, or upwards to 50 million pounds a year. So, it's an interesting twist in terms of, of how to present the argument for reducing the pollution. Slide six. Next slide, thanks. The committee made a number of important proposals. 
which they thought should be adopted to reduce the density of smoke in the atmosphere by about 80% over the next 10 or 15 years. Their main recommendations were that the emission of dark smoke, in particular noxious type of smoke, should be prohibited by law, that industries, when they installed new plant, should be required to take all practical steps to prevent the emission of grit and dust, and that local authorities should be empowered to designate smokeless zones and smoke control areas. The duty of inspection enforcement was placed on local authorities, except in the case of certain industrial processes which had special government inspectors. Householders in these smoke restricted or smokeless um, areas should convert their domestic fireplaces and these householders would be eligible to apply for grants um, from, the local from the local councils uh, via the exchequer. Next slide, please. Clearly, uh, these measures were not going to be uh, favorable to all. In particular, opposition to these new measures uh, drew attention to the very complex issues that were raised in terms of factories and furnaces and the cost that it would be borne by the various industrialists that were uh, running these premises. There was also the issue of placing on local authorities the responsibility for enforcement, which was particularly tricky where those local authorities were also uh, closely linked to some of the industrial and manufacturing bodies in their particular council areas um, and didn't necessarily want to upset them and may well in some councils have had vested interests in um, the success of these industrial and manufacturing uh, premises. And it was placing quite a burden on local authorities to go and tackle some of these very powerful industrialists uh, and manufacturers to try and enforce uh, these particular measures. Those who supported the proposed measures of uh, the Beaver uh, report said, focused particularly on the threat to health, the material damage to property, and the uh, need to foster the efficient use of coal and not waste fuel. There was a sort of hiatus um, in 1954 in terms of whether new legislation would be introduced. And in order to uh, try and overcome this, there was an attempt to introduce a private member's bill based on the Beaver recommendations. This, however, was withdrawn when the government decided to undertake a somewhat weaker clean air bill. Next slide, please. So four years after the Great Smog, Parliament brought in the Clean Air Act, 1956. It was later amended and extended um, in 1968 and 1993. What the Clean Air Act did was to follow up on a number of the recommendations of the Beaver Report. And in some cities, smokeless and smoke control zones were established and households were encouraged to switch to cleaner fuel. In principle, the act was fully operative in 1956, but it rested on local authorities to implement the measure. And it seemed that even though they had the power to do so, it was going to take a long time for any major achievement. The parliamentary secretary to the Ministry of Housing and Local Government, Sir Keith Joseph, speaking um, in parliament, said that the effectiveness of the various measures will be cumulative. And um, he indicated that the number of smoke control orders that were in operation um, at the end of October 1956 amounted to 104 smoke control orders. 
and others were promised. He had to admit, however, that many local authorities have achieved what can only be described as satisfactory progress and noted that the Beaver Committee referred to a period of 10 to 15 years being needed to achieve clean air throughout what were called the black areas, so the industrial areas essentially. One of the problems was that local authorities disputed that they were in black areas and other local authorities just refused to impose these various requirements. Despite the slowness of progress and the obstacles that had to be overcome at the time, the Clean Air Act was uh, generally accepted as being quite significant in its scope and application. It tackled the problem of emissions from chimneys, furnaces, um, and the declaration of smokeless areas and the emission of grit and dust. So it sought to tackle what were perceived as the major causes of pollution at the time. Uh, next slide, please. So the challenges persisted in terms of achieving what it had set out to do, particularly achieving the aims of the Beaver uh, Committee report. It was a long program, 10 to 15 years, and it had to cover an awful lot of households. So at the time there were 12 to 15 million houses in Britain, uh, most of which of course had open fires. There were 200,000 factory chimneys and 20,000 steam engines um, and 1 million or more commercial buildings, half of which were in black areas. So it was a very major problem. And one um, MP talking uh, in the House of Lords pointed out that in his own constituency, 30 to 40 tonnes of dust and grit are deposited per square mile in the course of a year. And if you think of that quantity, it really is quite significant. Um, and of course, it had related health issues. Next slide, please. It was recognised that it would take time to stop air pollution. The time perhaps was underestimated. It wasn't 10 to 15 years, the problem remains. In a report in Parliament in 1921, um, it was stated that exposure to pollution still presents one of the UK's biggest public health challenges, shortening lifespans and damaging the quality of life for many people. Robust action and commitment to tackle this silent killer has not been followed. And various um, health related issues were brought to the attention yet again of parliament. A crucial moment perperhaps came in 1921 in an inquest, a coroner's inquest, a second inquest that had been re requested by the child's mother into the death of nine-year-old Ella Adukisi Debra. The coroner, in an unprecedented statement, said that the cause of death of Ella was air pollution. He said, the evidence at the inquest was that there is no safe level for particulate matter and the World Health Organization guidelines should be seen as a minimum requirement. Legally binding targets based on World Health Organization guidelines would reduce the number of deaths from air pollution in the UK. Subsequently, Baroness Jones introduced a private member's bill into the House of Lords entitled the Clean Air Brackets Human Rights Bill. It was described as an act to establish the right to breathe clean air. The bill reached a second reading in the House of Lords, but didn't proceed any further. Next slide, please. 
At one stage, it looked as if the environmental bill might provide the opportunity to put Ella's law into action. But the final act, the Environment Act 1921, while it includes a section on particulate matter, does not meet the uh, targets of the World Health Organization. It does, however, establish a legally binding duty on government to bring forward at least two new air quality targets in secondary legislation. The deadline for that was the end of October of this year. On the 28th of October, the government confirmed that this legal deadline would be missed. The government is therefore in breach of its own legal obligation. The Royal College of Physicians has argued that there should be a much greater ambition and aiming for a reduction of air pollution by 2030. The government is focusing on 2040. So to conclude, I think it can be suggested that 70 years after the Great London Smog, while we are seeing some moves to create, if not pollution free, at least reduction in pollution efforts through the creation of inner city clean air zones. <clears throat> to what extent this will make a difference remains to be seen. As with the 1952 Great London Fog, it may well be the case that those living in the inner cities derive little benefit and continue to suffer most harm from air pollution. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sue. So um, let's move uh, smoothly on to Emma's paper, Direct Line to Beaching. Thank you, Fiona. I'll just try and smoothly share my slides. That would be good. There we go. Hopefully that's worked. Yeah, brilliant. So, um, I want to talk a little bit today about the development of the railways, particularly um, the modernisation plan of the 1950s and its ultimate failure. But to begin my talk, I wanted to think about how people tend to perceive the development of the railways. And it was fairly easy to come up with some kind of standard images or stereotypes or tropes that you tend to see associated with the railways, which I've tried to capture on this slide here. So the starting point really had to be the opening of the first modern railroad, which was the Manchester to Liverpool line in September 1830 and Stevenson's rocket. But of course, then we're going to fast forward a little bit into living memory. And there are still many people who remember, often very nostalgically, this kind of idyllic vision of a steam train racing through the English countryside, maybe ones like the Flying Scotsman locomotive, for example. Even younger generations probably can talk about Thomas the Tank Engine and Percy and things like that. Then you have the British Rail era. And this is, is an era that covers the 1950s, but it's often associated with a kind of utilitarian buffet car, car, like in the bottom left of the screen, peeling cheese sandwiches, endless jokes about delays, lots of criticism. Then you have the new franchising arrangements, you have the apparently shiny new services offered by companies such as Virgin. And then coming right up to the present, we have the ongoing uh, industrial action by many railway staff. Um, when you look at these images, it's really easy to see the development of the railways as divided into very clear and distinct phases. But what I want to argue today is that many of the issues and the challenges that the railways have faced and are facing are in fact a product of its initial development and the somewhat patchwork and confused policy and legislation that gradually developed about it. And I also want to argue that, in fact, this is just one of the many examples of the ways in which the history of the railways and law intersect and which are really deserving of further consideration. But the particular issue I want to talk about today to illustrate these wider points is the British Transport Commission's plan for the modernisation and re-equipping of British railways, which is commonly known as the modernisation plan. 
it was published in December 1954, and it began to be very slowly implemented in 1955. The context for this is despite the strategic importance of the railways in the war effort in both world wars, and despite the nationalisation of the railways in 1948, at the point that the plan was published, the general perception was that British railways were inefficient, ill-equipped and unprofitable. In fact, the railway historian Christian Woolmer notes that at the point that the modernisation plan was published, the railways were actually losing £22 million per year, which is around £400 million, um, in contemporary money. There was a political impetus for reform from the Conservative government of the early 1950s, who changed the management structure of the railways, one of many, many changes over the decades, abolishing a railway executive and putting in place the British Transport Commission, who then had direct charge of the railways, along with many other forms of transport. The Commission's modernisation plan cost £1.2 billion, which was, going, which was to be lent to the railways by the government. And railway historian Tanya Jackson suggests that this is equivalent to around £25 billion today. And the plan's focus was on creating within the next 15 years um, an efficient and modernised railway system that could be economically self-sufficient. It predicted that this was going to generate an additional £85 million per year in um, revenue. And as you can see um, from the quote from the plan on the screen, it talks about the transformation of virtually all the forms of services now offered by British Railways. So some of the key elements of the plan included improvements to the track and the signalling, stopping the manufacturing of steam locomotives from 1956, introducing hundreds of diesel and electric locomotives, electrifying hundreds of miles of track, updating and replacing coaches and freight services. And um, it, it always tickles me a little bit this, it talks about uh, a mere 35 million on what they describe as sundry other items, which apparently uh, include things such as staff welfare and office mechanisms. So it was a very ambitious plan. As I say, it started in 1955. Um, there was a reappraisal of the plan published by the Commission in July 1959. And at this point, it identified a number of what it termed successes in implementing parts of the plan. But it noted that in 1957, it had had to revise its estimate for the cost of the plan upwards from 1.2 billion to 1.5 billion. And it stated that this was largely due to the uh, rises in the in the prices of things, but also due to a more detailed evaluation of parts of the plan. In 1961, the um, Commission then published a progress report on the modernisation plan, and you can see this online, and it, it, it feels like it's kind of been, um, had a marketing team have their hands on it. It involves lots of glossy pictures um, showing all different aspects of the railway with lots of smiling customers. And it noted that they, they saw 1960 of something as a turning point. They suggested that by this stage, there were visible improvements that could be seen in railway services. Despite the very rosy image you get if you look at this progress report, however, it was only two years later that there was the publication of the first of two, what I think could be termed notorious or infamous reports on the railways. The first of these in 1963 was the reshaping of British Railways. The second was the development of the major railway trunk routes in 1965. This was written by Richard Beeching, published by the British Railways Board, and this led to the Beeching cuts, the Beeching reforms that are very commonly uh, known about, and, and the closure of many, many miles um, of branch lines. Now, in fact, the seeds for this were also sown a lot earlier, in 1949, there'd been a creation of a branch line committee who had considered some closures and indeed implemented some closures. And in 1956, there'd been a government white paper on railway proposals, which also recommended cuts. And it had led to um, parliamentary debate, which you can see in Hansard, there was a lot of concern about the precarious financial positions of the railways. 
basically throughout the late 1950s, the, the railways were falling deeper and deeper into debt, and it had reached the stage where they simply couldn't meet the loan repayments to the government for the loans taken out for the modernisation plan. In fact, overall, most railway historians now view the railway modernisation plan as a costly failure. Uh, it did have some benefits. It progressed the move away from steam, although arguably this was something that should have taken place um, several years earlier. And in fact, it was still not until 1960 that British Rail commissioned the last British built steam locomotive. Um, but most importantly, the plan didn't make the railways economically self-sufficient and it wasn't enough to prevent those later cuts by beaching. It's been heavily criticised for failing to acknowledge the more fundamental shifts that were likely to occur in transportation, the level of competition for freight from the roads and the increased use of other methods such as air travel. Although there is one government minister at the time who did mention he felt that soon everybody would be flying around in their own private helicopter. Um, there were a lot of practical difficulties um, while implementing this modernization. The railways had to keep running as an important, valuable service, public service. And there was a lot of factionalism. There's a lot of rivalry between different regions and managers as well. The sheer scale of the modernization also caused difficulties. So, for example, um, the commission ended up commissioning um, some untested classes of diesel locomotives to try and meet the target for the number they needed. And in fact, in all, they commissioned 26 different classes where uh, Christian Woolmer estimates that five would have been sufficient. So there were lots and lots of reasons feeding into the failure of the plan. But actually, one of the widely acknowledged difficulties was the initial structure put in place by a series of acts, the Railway and Canal Traffic Act, which were introduced by um, governments from 1854 to 1896, so very much towards the start of the development of the railways. Because at the inception of the railways, they were actually viewed very much by governments as a private enterprise. Although you would need private bills going through Parliament to create and run new lines, and often this involved a lot of complex negotiations between landowners and railway companies, in fact, there wasn't really any concerted effort to oversee the development of the railways as a whole, to kind of rationalise which lines there would be in which places and why. There were some individuals who argued for this, there were proposals for commissions, but they never really took hold. So there just wasn't that attempt to actually rationalise the various proposals or take a holistic view. What happened was various schemes would come up before Parliament and they'd each be considered on their own merits. And of course, one, one example of this that's pretty well known is the fact that for a long time there was no single standard of gauge. So Brunel's Great Western Railway went for the wide gauge, um, whereas other companies preferred what's now the standard gauge today. And we have this kind of tangle of railway lines um, across Britain. So some of this reluctance for the governments to step in and provide this wider oversight probably relates to the, the politicians at the time, their adherence to this kind of laissez-faire economics. And actually, to some extent, it was the market forces that determined the progress of the railways. So some schemes simply couldn't obtain funding, some got partway and failed, some lines closed, and there were plenty of individual fortunes that were made and lost, particularly during the railway mania of the 1840s. However, the government did on occasion respond to calls and they did introduce this somewhat piecemeal set of legislation. And the key point here that relates to the modernization plan is that it obligated railways to provide carriage for virtually any type of goods, regardless of the quantity of those goods, regardless of which stations they were running between. And this all had to be done at set and published rates. And this was because when the railways were developing, they effectively had a monopoly as the sole kind of long distance transport provider. They were clearly overtaken stagecoaches uh, and canals. So section two of the Railway and Canal Traffic Act of 1854 required railway and canal companies to afford all reasonable facilities for the receiving and forwarding and delivery of traffic and required them not to give any undue or unreasonable preference to or in favour 
of any particular person or company or any particular description of traffic in any respect whatsoever. The problem was by the 1950s that um, railways were in competition with road transport who could carry freight and they had not they didn't have this kind of legal restriction they could turn down work which they wouldn't profit from that was uneconomic and they could undercut um the rates which um the railways had to publish and had to uh, adhere to so what it meant in practice was that the railways had to maintain thousands of good yards other facilities stock staff all to do with freight, even when actually there was a, a, the demand was less and less and less, and the traffic that did exist was rarely very profitable. Even though um, there'd been campaigns for many years, perhaps since about the 20s, for this position to change, it wasn't actually until the Transport Act of 1962 that British Rail were given a, a freedom of contract, and that meant looking at the modernization plan in 1955 it still had to commission locomotives and rolling stock and facilities to manage this kind of legally required freight traffic so for example it commissioned 30 marshalling yards at a cost of 85 million and 300,000 new freight wagons so this example of the impact of the railway and canal traffic acts on the railways of the 1950s really demonstrates that it's not possible to divide the history and development of the railways into neat phrases or snapshots. Instead, it illustrates that there have been really long lasting impacts by different decisions that have been made. And these have often been caused by a kind of lack of oversight or a clear vision of what the railways could and should be. It provides a really clear example of how the railways development has been intertwined with legislative policy development and also historical kind of competing interests. What I also think is interesting is it illustrates just how much of a topic for socio legal research the railways and their development can and should be. I think it's important to end by emphasising that the railways impact so many aspects of life. So some examples of this on the slide. It was the railways that really uh, standardised the measurement of time using Greenwich Mean Time through their um, to use their timetables. It led to a increasing tort and contract cases because of the sudden ability and the sudden movement of so many numbers of people and freight at cheaper prices. So as an obligations lawyer, I could mention Parker and Southeastern Railway as a classic example there. It also brought to the fore many issues around health and safety. I'm sat in Sheffield near the Woodhead Pass, where it, which was notorious for the loss of life of workers in its construction. So just to conclude, I don't think it's an exaggeration to end by suggesting that using the modernization plan and thinking about the railway in the 1950s actually provides us with, with a snapshot into its development and its influence and the fact that it has this huge potential socio-legal interest. Thank you very much, Emma. That was really interesting. And I love the illustrations. Lovely. Okay, so um, we're now going to move on to Gwyneth Parry's uh, paper called A University in or of Wales, Vasey's Folly and St David's College Lampeter, which is a very intriguing title. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, um, I'm going to try also and uh, see if I can uh, use my uh, visual aids and see if it works. Uh, otherwise, I shall have to I wonder if that's worked. Is there something coming up? Yeah, we can see that. Yeah, we are. Well, thanks yep. very much indeed. Excellent. Thank you, Fiona. Well, um, first of all, just to thank uh, Fiona and Rosemary uh, for the invitation to participate in this uh, fascinating event today. Um, I'm a long-standing admirer of their work. I was going to say secret admirer, but uh, 
I stop just in the nick of time in case somebody gets the wrong impression. But it's wonderful to uh, to take part in these proceedings, which of course have been so excellently organized. Uh, secondly, I'd like to offer an apology. Uh, many of the fascinating papers that will be presented today will address some important milestones in the development of the law of England and Wales, if not the law on a further, on a wider plane. Um, my paper, in contrast, is arguably an exercise in anti-legal history. Uh, but for those whose delight lies in social legal history or social history with a bit of law thrown in, well, I may have something to offer. In uh, February 1951, the Chancery Division of the High Court was presented with questions which had not hitherto uh, troubled the courts of England and Wales. What is a university and what are its defining characteristics? The plaintiff was St David's College Lampeter an institution founded in 1822 upon the initiative of the then Bishop of St. David's, Thomas Burgess, and other benefactors. This year, therefore, marked its bicentenary. Its founding mission was to offer higher learning for men aspiring to take holy orders and minister within the Church of England, especially in Wales. But during the 19th century, the institution would evolve and offer a broad and liberal education across the humanities and sciences, including mathematics, and geography, and acquired its own degree awarding powers in 1852, the BD, and in 1865, the BA. And a supplemental charter of 1896 made it clear that admission to the college was open to men who were not aspiring to church ministry, and that its role was to quote, to receive and educate any person whatsoever. Person, of course, meaning a men. As such, and certainly by the beginning of the 20th century, it could claim to be more than simply a theological college. Yet the vast majority of his students until the Second World War were in fact aspiring clergy. And there was a general perception of it being a church institution in a country where the majority of the people were communicants with one of the nonconformist Protestant denominations, especially the Calvinistic Methodists, the Independents, and the Baptists. Accordingly, led by the political representatives of the nonconformist, liberal, and Welsh speaking population, the university movement in Wales gathered pace during the course of the 19th century culminating in the establishment of university colleges at Aberystwyth in 1872, Cardiff in 1883, and Bangor in 1884, and most importantly, the Federal University of Wales in 1893. These institutions were founded firmly on non-denominational lines, as had been the case with the University of London earlier in the century. They were also the products of that growing sense of national identity in Wales, referred to as a national rebirth by some historians, which was a driving force in the political discourse in Wales at the end of the 19th century. Although it did not culminate in national self-determination in the way that had occurred in parts of Europe or Ireland, it did begat some cultural expressions of national identity. Uh, including the university and its colleges, the National Library, and the National Museum. By 1893, Wales therefore had its National Federal University, with three constituent colleges, which awarded undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in a broad range of subjects. But what of St David's College Lampeter? Although some discussion had occurred about its potential membership of the University of Wales during the 1890s, that did not come to pass. Partly because one of the raging political issues of the time was the disestablishment of the Church of England in Wales. Most within the church were opposed to it, and most nonconformists were in favor. 
The opposition from the established church, uh, which who galvanized support from the nobility and aristocracy in the House of Lords, who voted consistently against this establishment, was one of the principal drivers of the constitutional reform of the House of Lords in the early 20th century that led, that was led and orchestrated primarily by one prominent Welsh nonconformist parliamentarian by the name of David Lloyd George. And we owe the Parliament Act of 1911, which removed the Lord's veto on legislation, at least in part, to the great saga of Welsh disestablishment. And disestablishment eventually won out with the Welsh Church Act of 1914, which took effect from 1920. And as you can see from the cartoon, uh, among the east burning issues of the day, the smallest lion is the Welsh disestablishment, the larger lion is universal suffrage, which probably reflects the relative importance of those, those issues, home rule being the middle one. Um, well, um, disestablishment was probably one of the reasons for Lampeter's exclusion from the federal university. But there were other, uh, more cultural factors at play. Uh, Lampeter was generally seen as an alien English institution in the heart of Welsh-speaking Wales. Its ethos and institutional mentality were long perceived to be anglicised and out of touch with Welsh sentiments. Indeed, it might uh, even be said that it had a colonialist view towards Wales and its people. A former student, the Reverend Canon Daniel Parry Jones, who was at Lampeter in the period immediately before the First World War, recalled this institutional ethos in his memoir, Welsh Country Upbringing. And here is a quotation. On my first day there, I realized it was not a Welsh college at all. It was merely a college in Wales. Though built in honor of our patron saint, St. David, poor St. David had to be satisfied with that alone for we were never told anything about him or the church to which he belonged. We read English history and English church history, but never Welsh history or Welsh church history. Now the college lacked sympathy with Welsh aspirations and showed little understanding of the Welsh temperament. Uh, but it is easy to oversimplify. And the true picture is probably far more complicated. Throughout its history, there had been individuals within the institution who promoted an approach that was more tuned with Welsh sentiments. As Parry Jones also noted in his memoir, Lorimer Thomas, professor of Welsh during his time there, was supportive of the Welsh student societies during the years leading up to the Great War. Indeed, there had been lecturers and professors of Welsh at the institution from the outset, with Rice Rees, lecturer in Welsh in the 1820s, and Daniel Sylvan Evans, the great lexicographer in the 1840s. Uh, Maurice Jones, uh, who appears before you now, was principal from 1923 to 1938. He was the son of a trouser and shoemaker who had gained a first class degree at Oxford before serving for many years as a chaplain in the army. He was a Welsh-speaking member of the Gorsel of Bards of the National East Elvod, under the Bardic name Meiri Prasor, and served as treasurer of the Gorsel from 1925 to 1938. His Welsh credentials were not in any doubt, and it could even be argued that the institutional ethos towards the Welsh language and Welsh culture in Lampeter was no less hostile than in that of some of the constituent colleges of the University of Wales. Uh, be that as it may, at the turn of the 20th century, Lampeter was to carry on as a degree awarding institution separated from the federal arrangements of the University of Wales. But by the 1940s, St. David's College Lampeter was in dire financial straits, with dwindling student numbers and no support from the public purse. An institution whose practical function to external appearances was the training of ordinance for church ministry was finding itself in an increasingly precarious position. 
Although disestablishment became a convenient explanation for many of the ills facing the Anglican Church in Wales after the First World War, the truth again was more complex. Uh, church and chapel attendance uh, were dwindling, driven by spiritual disillusionment in the aftermath of the war and increased secularization. Indeed, for Christianity in Wales, the battle for disestablishment was a pyrrhic victory. By the 1940s, Lampeter saw that a judicial pronouncement on its university status um, as a leverage uh, to force the University Grants Committee to provide it with financial assistance as being the way forward. Uh, the University Grants Committee did not regard Lampeter as a university and so did not offer it the financial support which other inst uh, university institutions enjoyed. Moreover, Lampeter students were denied state scholarships that would otherwise support their studies. Now, Lampeter's principal from 1938 was Henry Kingsley Archdod, an Australian cleric who had previously served as chaplain at Wellington College and fellow Corpus Christi Cambridge. And like many of his predecessors and successors, Archdod was not a Welshman and found it difficult to grasp the political milieu in which he sought to lead his fragile college. But he knew that to gain recognition as a university was crucial for financial stability and institutional survival. And so it was that the principal briefed Sir Andrew Clark, KC, a leading advocate at the Chancery Bar, appears here on the left, to make the case for recognizing Lampeter as a university. The respondent, the Ministry of Education, was re represented by Dennis Buckley KC, later a Lord Justice of Appeal. And the matter eventually came before a judge in the Chancery Division in February 1951. The judge was Mr. Justice Bates. Uh, Sir Harry Vasey uh, was the product of Shrewsbury School and Hartford College, Oxford. Called to the bar of Lincoln's Inn in 1901, he took silk in 1925 and was appointed a judge of the High Court in 1944 at the somewhat ripe age of 67 years. By the time the present matter came before him, he was 73 years of age. He was a high churchman, an authority on ecclesiastical law, and had served as Chancellor of the Diocese of Derby and Wakefield from uh, 1928 to 1944, uh, Chancellor of the Diocese of Carlisle from 1930 to 1944, Vicar General of the Province of York from 1934 to 1944, and Commissary General for the Diocese of Canterbury from 1942 again till 1944. With these credentials, Archdell might have had good cause to expect him to be a sympathetic judge, one of our own, so to speak, who could be rather supportive of an institution which seemed to be engaged in a mission to civilize the, the uncivilized Welsh. But Vesey was uh, unpredictable and somewhat eccentric. Among the achievements attributed to him was his definition of a gentleman's agreement, which he defined as thus. A gentleman's agreement is, a, is an agreement which is not an agreement, made by two people, neither of whom are gentlemen, whereby each expects the other to be strictly bound without himself being bound at all. Uh, somewhat reminiscent, isn't it, of Samuel Goldwyn's definition of a verbal agreement, which is not worth the paper it's written on. But anyway, Thurley Vasey had a sense of humor. But turning back to the matter in hand, Sir Andrew Clark KC presented a rational and compelling case on behalf of Lampeter. He set out some criteria for university status and showed how Lampeter satisfied them all. 
they were firstly a charter conferred by the crown or a comparable high authority, perhaps the Pope in years past or uh, in other jurisdictions. Well, that was clearly established. Uh, secondly, that access was open to all regardless of creed. Well, that had certainly been true since 1896, if not earlier. Uh, three, that there existed there a community of academic teachers. Again, that was not in doubt. At least, fourthly, at least one of the higher faculties were present. Theology being one, and there was clearly a strong faculty of theology there. Law, philosophy and medicine would have been the others that would have satisfied that particular uh, criteria. Uh, and then fifthly, buildings and residence for students. Well, we've already seen some of the buildings and quite uh, nice buildings they are too, modeled of course on an Oxford college. And finally, the power to award degrees. Again, it had the power to do so. To support his arguments, Clark called on an array of impressive witnesses including the registrars of both Oxford and Cambridge, and the principal of Jesus College Oxford, who all attested that a Lampeter degree was of good standing and allowed graduates to proceed to further studies at, uh, at his college without having to undertake um, uh, matriculation examinations or other tests. Uh, Dennis Buckley KC for the respondents, uh, judging by the newspaper reports, clearly struggled to refute the arguments and even conceded that Lampeter offered university, uh, sorry, offered education of a quote, university character. But even when faced with um, lackluster resistance by the respondent, uh, Vesey uh, prevaricated. He began by stating that the expression university was not a term of art before proceeding to try and turn it into one. He found that Lampeter's size and limited degree awarding powers, the BA and the BD, weakened its case for university status. He then went on to offer a rather circular, if not bizarre criterion, namely that whether an institution is a university or not, can be decided by reference to what the ordinary man would say if he were asked whether this college is a university. What did he mean? The man on the Clapham omnibus? No, he went on to explain that he meant the ordinary man who does know what a university is or who has received his education at a university. How such a man would justify his opinion and state what a university is, was left unanswered. Because it was nothing other than an example of the false authority fallacy. He then added a further weakness to Lampeter's case, which, is that the, which was that the institution's charters did not explicitly state that it was a university. This was, he said, in contrast to the University of Wales, which uh, Vesey said was incorporated as a university. Lampeter, he said, was a borderline case. Indeed, he said, in a class of its own. This judgment was hardly a pinnacle in legal reasoning. Interestingly, no one thought it relevant that Lampeter admitted men only, unlike the constituent colleges of the University of Wales, which had been admitting women soon after, if not at the time of their founding. And this state of affairs continued at Lampeter until 1965. Vesey's judgment turned on this nebulous and fallacious reasonable university educated man test, combined with a narrow literal interpretation of the institution's charters. A more purposive approach, which Andrew Clark, KC had argued for, that is, did the institution behave like a university by providing a university education? Did it have staff who could be described as academic university staff, which were conferred with professors, uh, professorial status, for example, which was indeed the case? And did it have degree awarding powers? Well, that approach was not adopted. The fact that the institution was small 
and only offered undergraduate degrees in the humanities ought not to have been fatal, as that was the feature of the North Staffordshire, Staffordshire University College, which did receive government support at that time. Of course, that institution is more well known as Keele University. I suspect some of you will know rather well. A key stumbling block for Lampeter was Section 100 of the Education Act 1944, which gave the minister absolute discretion in recognizing an institution as a university for the purposes of receiving financial support from the government. As, the, as such, this might have been Vase's escape route, but oddly, he chose not to take it up in his judgment. But he did appeal uh, for a more sympathetic approach from the ministry towards the institution and hoped that some special financial provision might be made to support its work. In trying to make sense of it all, it might also be said that Vesey took a normative stance. He did not really answer the question, was Lampeter a university as a matter of fact, but whether it ought to be regarded so as a matter of policy. In light of the government stance, and in view of the broader context of Welsh life. The judgment was criticized by informed commentators and even, even uh, christened Vesey's folly. Can we therefore uh, simply dismiss the outcome as poor judgment by an eccentric judge? Well, this is where potentially anyway gets a bit more complicated. Uh, the Minister for Education during what would become the dying months of Ackley's Labour government was George Tomlinson. It is doubtful that this Lancastrian had a strong personal view on the matter, but his close associates in the government might well have brought influence to bear on his judgment. As is well known, the government of Clement Attlee had a strong Welsh representation. In particular, it is probable that fellow cabinet members and Aaron Bevan, Ness Edwards, and perhaps more crucially, James Griffiths, would have alerted him to the political sensitivities surrounding Lampeter's bid for university status. Although not a party to the action, the University of Wales had a vested interest in the outcome. Indeed, as recently as 1944, the University of Wales had rebuffed Lampeter's advances when it had sought to reopen the question of its relationship with the federal university. The University of Wales also had considerable political leverage. Uh, James Griffiths had been awarded an honorary LLD of the university in 1946. Moreover, another influential body, the University Grants Committee, which had initially been added as, as a party to the legal action, but whose involvement had been discontinued, concurred with the Minister of Education's view that Lampeter was not a university. It had, since 1948, the founder of the, universe, of the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, Sir David Hughes Parry, among its members. This resolute defender of the University of Wales would become its vice chairman from 1951 onwards. Now I have not found the smoking gun because I suspect that it's been thrown to the, into the river a long time ago. But to summarize, uh, the University of Wales had some formidable political operators to protect its interests and to influence the position taken by the Ministry of Education. Of course, Vesey could have decided the other way, but the Ministry of Education's objection must have weighed on his mind, even if he did not say so openly. Although Henry Archdall gave the prospect of an appeal to a higher tribunal some consideration, a combination of financial constraints and physical and mental exhaustion, exacerbated by the recent death of his wife, meant that he had no appetite for a replay before different judges. Tired and demoralized, Archdell would resign the principalship in 1953 
and hand over the care of Lampeter to his successor, J.R. Lloyd Thomas, seen here on the left, who would continue the campaign to secure Lampeter's future. The postscript is that Lampeter, uh, with the support of University College in Cardiff, would eventually become a constituent member of the Federal University of Wales, and so secure for itself government financial aid. Vesey's judgment for what it was worth would also become redundant with subsequent legislation. And the irony of ironies is this, since the beginning of the present century, there has been a steady exodus of the old constituent colleges of the, of the University of Wales, namely Aberystwyth, Cardiff, Bangor, and later Swansea, which was established in 1920, from the Federal University of Wales, as they have acquired independent status and independent degree awarding status. Today, however, Lampeter continues to award University of Wales degree. Its degree of awarding powers has been put in abeyance uh, after it joined the University of Wales in 1971. What further might be said in conclusion? The case with which this paper has been concerned can hardly be described as a milestone in the story of the common law. It is not for its legal value that it acquires fascination. Indeed, when the law report is read in isolation, the judgment is barely comprehensible, let alone rational. But when it is conceptualized, it gives us an insight into the politics of higher, edu higher education and indeed the politics in general of Wales during the first half of the 20th century. A denominationalism had a strange longevity in Welsh life, even after the church pews and the chapel galleries had long started to empty. It also, I think, provides us with a small and modest case study in the limitations of black letter analysis of law reports. Much of what I have presented today is not to be found in the reported judgment. Making sense of things requires a reading between the lines, consulting the press reports and other non-legal sources, and acknowledging that political dimension which often colours legal judgment. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you so much, Gwyn. That was fascinating. And something about which um, even those of us really interested in higher education, legal education, have probably just never come across before. It was really interesting. Thank you so much. Oh, lovely. So, so first, thanks very much uh, for oh, well, allowing the paper into the, um, the session. Uh, I, I'm very grateful for that and also for the sort of impetus of the the idea of thinking about the 1950s um you'll note from the handout to this slide the title has changed a bit so um as i've been working on the paper i've been influenced by the work of rosemary and and others erica rackley etc to think more about the central position of mrs hutchinson instead of um you know lord upjohn as my original title had so um that part of the paper, I must be honest, is still embryonic in the sense that uh, a feminist lens isn't one that I'm used to using. I'm basically a corporate insolvency communitarianism scholar, but it's one that I've been you know, enjoying getting into and, and thinking about and, uh, uh, and one which will hopefully be a major feature of the final paper um, in its final form. So there's that little bit of a, a change. And you also see at the end of the title, there's now the insertion of this feminist judgment um, point as well, because again, as part of the process of bringing the paper together, uh, obviously I've been engaging in the, the feminist judgment project, uh, and the various outputs that have come from that. And, uh, and we're starting to try and mull on the idea of to what extent up John's judgment in Stevens and Hutchinson, the case in 1953 that I'm gonna talk about, um, can be accounted uh, a feminist judgment. I'm probably going to conclude at the moment that it isn't, um, for the reasons I'll explain, but um, still it stands as an aberration from the normal run of cases that we'll look at where 
the the wife in this instance was given you know, better treatment than normally would happen um, in relation to creditors anyway. And so that's why the title is a little bit different. Um, there is a version available which uh, I can share with anyone who wants to look at it. Just in terms of summary, though, I, I just thought it'd be useful to give you this diagram before I commence with the full exposition. So th this is probably familiar to most of you in terms of the the idea of uh, the kind of debates that Lorna Fox Mahoney and Rosemary as well as um, uh, drawn our attention to in terms of the house as a, you know, is it an asset available in a bankruptcy or should we view it instead in a, a broader uh, holistic view as some kind of home environment instead that has this multiplicity of stakeholders that I've put there on the slide. Uh, and for me, the most important one of those stakeholders, of course, is, uh, well, children and minors, those that are, of course, affected by the bankruptcy, but have no part to play in it. Um, and in her paper earlier on, Rosemary touched on Denning's deserted wife's equity. Uh, I, I'll touch briefly on that a little bit later and those, some of those cases. But <laughs> broadly speaking here, what I'm looking at is a case of course, Stevens and Hutchinson that uh, involves joint tenants uh, and therefore the equitable interest is an interest in a trust for sale as then was. So that red dividing line here, uh, uh, of course, is, is a division of asset value that could, of course, go or be available in terms of here, I put the husband because invariably it is the husband with this, uh, 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 with, with this sort of uh, exposure to the bankruptcy creditors that we usually see in the cases. Uh, and I say that as the editor of Mule Hunter, who has to put 90 cases a year into the book. Uh, uh, it does seem to be uh, the husband generally that, that um, behaves in a similar way as we'll see to Stevens and Hutchinson. So there's this tension underlying what we're looking at. Is the house or the asset, the home available for distribution or a portion of it for creditors? And if it is, what does that mean about how those other stakeholders come to participate in that home stroke asset. Unlike America, we don't have a homestead uh, exemption, so it is available. It's it's something that can be um, realised potentially. So that's the sort of background tension. Uh, and what I want to try and test is the extent to which Stevens and Hutchinson in 1953 and Lord Upjohn or Mr Justice Upjohn as he then was, his judgment can be accounted some kind of important beginning point of our view of the, the home asset change. Uh, that's to say, instead of just viewing the, the, ho uh, sorry, the property as a um, asset that can be sold quickly using the trust for sale, can it in, instead form a, a, an asset that uh, takes account of these wider stakeholders? So that moves me to the what happened to Mrs. Hutchinson point that I've just addressed in my title when I was thinking about trying to put her more centrally in this story that I'm trying to recount in the uh, in the paper. Alas, the the well, both for Lord Upjohn and for Mrs. Hutchinson, there's a dearth of archival material so far. I'm still working on it, um, uh, but but I haven't managed to show. Uh, much about her other than her position obviously as a defendant in the Stevens and Hutchinson second defendant she was in the case um, but as I say uh, as the paper progresses that centrality of her um, activity as a defendant and her place in the story I think is what I need to, to have as a paramount um, consideration so what actually happened in this case in 1953 well, uh, I, one other introductory point I should say, you, you may be familiar with a very famous bankruptcy case, Bendel and McVerter, as part of um, Lord Denning's activity with the deserted wife's equity. Uh, uh, and, you know, obviously that gets talked about a lot because of uh, well, the nature of, uh, of his judicial uh, creativity uh, and activity. Uh, and it was always a puzzle to me really why Stevenson Hutchinson wasn't so famous or wasn't so um, uh, well known or written about in the textbooks. Indeed, in some of the cases that I'm talking about, it's not mentioned later on either. Um, particularly as, as perhaps I'll now explain, it is this kind of aberration, at least in the sense of 
the 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 wife being treated in a way that one wouldn't normally expect in these situations of division of asset value. Hence why Denning was up to his activity with the uh, uh, deserted wife's equity. So it's a very short judgment, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, 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 as what they were generally at the time. But that means th there's not much to delve into in a certain sense. So um, there's the property, or I say that, but I don't think it is the original property. On the title information document for 29, uh, sorry, 39 Car Lane, there is um, discussion of a covenant from 1901. So it, I, I think there was a house there before this building, um, uh, 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 and it would be great to do a David Olasuga and sort of trace back how that property has changed over time and why we come to ha now have this more modern building. So I can't say for certain exactly uh, whether or not it was within this house that Mrs. Hutchinson and Mr. Hutchinson owned respectively as uh, tenants in common the the uh, half each of the, the asset of the property, I should say. Uh, and that property was bequested to the married couple by the husband, Mr. Hutchinson's father. So it was a, a gift and that was to provide a matrimonial home. That was the, the reason for the gift. In due course, the home becomes attractive to uh, an outside stakeholder. And of course, that's the creditors, because the husband is, as you'll see from the next slide, uh, well, a bankrupt. Uh, uh, he's also called a spendthrift. Uh, uh, that's to say somebody who you know, spends a, a, a will with no responsibility is called a near do well as well a, a contraction of never do well uh, uh, and generally accounted the sort of person that nowadays would be subject to uh, a bankruptcy restrictions order or undertaking which would probably delay their discharge from bankruptcy um, also in terms of the facts it was the case that mrs hutchinson would lend Mr. Hutchinson money throughout the course of this um, uh, indebtedness episode, <coughs> excuse me, leaving her with very little in terms of her own funds um, to perhaps seek alternative accommodation or generally to exist. Um, so eventually one of the creditors uh, tries to, well, applies rather, I should say, to the court for an order for um, a sale pursuant to section 30 of the LPA 1925. Um, uh, as we know, at this stage, we're dealing with land that's held uh, on a trust for sale. So they apply to the courts for that order as a person interested, to use the language of the section. Um, when up John uh, hears these facts, uh, of course, he then delivers a judgment which says well the reason for his decision is that the creditor is not a person interested for the purposes of the provision of section 30 so in terms of the reason for the decision that's where the judgment stops he the, the creditor uh stevens is not a person interested um that's because of course they're not a party to the joint tenancy trust for sale agreement that's extant which underlines uh, or underpins this ownership interest in the house but what's most interesting to me is what comes next, which is the next slide, where there's up John looking at some of his obiter comments there. So this is some obiter treatment that that comes next, and I'll, I'll just read it once and I'll unpack it a bit. Um, so, but this quote, but this much is clear that both the plaintiff and the second defendant, that's the wife, uh, of, and the plaintiff, obviously the creditor, have suffered from the first defendant, that's the husband who has treated the plaintiff very badly and who appears to have treated his wife extremely badly for many years. And then here's this, this quite loaded comment. Here's a near do well and a waster. This is the matrimonial home and the wife who is an equity owner of half the house is living there. I can see no ground on which it would be right or proper for the court to order a sale of the property in order that the judgment creditor may be satisfied. So these are obiter comments, but still ones that stuck with me, uh, mainly for the expressive language. Apparently Upjohn's father was um, known to deploy, he was also a King's counsel, um, was known to deploy uh, strong language on occasion. And I was wondering why Upjohn might 
deploy this kind of language, which you know, borderline unjudicial maybe, I'm not sure, other than if you view it through the prism of the 1950s and the bankruptcy laws at the time. So don't forget we're dealing with the 1914 Act as amended, the Bankruptcy Act of 1914, uh, and then uh, some amendments in 1928, but still uh, you know, a relatively draconian bankruptcy um, set of procedures that, for example, don't have automatic discharge. That didn't come till 1976. So at this stage, there are about 30 to 40,000 bankrupts who were floating around in England and Wales who were undischarged bankrupts. And they could only get their discharge if they um, well, went to court to get an order to discharge them from that legal state, which, which of course, uh, is the kind of application that Mr Justice Upjohn, as he then was, would have um, heard. So... I was thinking maybe some of this language, the strength of this language is drawn across from those discharge applications and any orders that he made there. And then more generally because of just the nature of bankruptcy at the time in the mid early 50s that we're talking about. So that's the, the first point I think is quite interesting. The second then I've put in red for you, and that's obviously the matrimonial home. Uh, 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 and that's going to come up a bit more in a bit more depth in the next slide but of course it's an important point for my general underlying theme of that what we could call the lot the fox mahoney or the uh Akimuti point about home or asset you know what is it is it a home for these broader stakeholders or is it an asset that can be realized for the benefit of the creditors we don't care about those other stakeholders um it's their tough luck to be the dependent of a bankrupt on um, that kind of thing um so that, that's the sort of language that first attracted me to the case. Uh, 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 and of course, the, that uh, comparative lack of fame compared with Bendel and Verta that I've uh, referred to, um, which takes me then to trying uh, to uh, uh, the next slide, where I try and in the paper uh, examine any intentions or background biographical material that might help shed light on that language deployment from Upjohn, uh, and then perhaps also to try and explain why Mrs Hutchinson was permitted to stay in the house, um, which is of course the final order of, of Mrs Justice Upjohn, um, to the detriment obviously of the creditors. Um, uh, 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 and so on the left you've got this division of treatment with intention, so I was trying to look at some background material that might have affected any moral decisions that Upjohn was making when he was deploying that language uh, in the exercise of his discretion under Section 30 that we've been examining. Um, as you can see, he had quite a close link. This is the first bullet point with Lincoln's Inn um, over time. Alas, their file, even for his Treasury year, is you know uh, brief in the extreme. Um, the National Archive has got some interesting stuff. I'll come on to that in a subsequent slide, but none of it's apposite to the point that we're discussing, namely Section 30, the exercise of discretion, and then the broader point about the home asset debate uh, uh, genesis that we're thinking about. He went to Trinity College, Cambridge, uh, and neither in that library or the broader library or other big collections uh, is there any information of use perhaps it's you know he died young as i'll explain in a moment perhaps that stands for why there's no you know deposit of any archive or any of his work um in some of those collections there is some evidence of him engaging in these issues in earlier cases when he was counsel junior counsel as he was for the respondent in uh, the buchanan wollaston case in 1939 for the Lord Green, the, the master of the roles at the time, where he was, as I've said, uh, arguing on behalf of the respondents, uh, particularly in relation to Section 26.3, as you can see, which is the provision that makes us think about or should make uh, 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 the judge think about the interests of the beneficiaries of that trust for sale and what they might want to happen to that um, property that the trust for sale sits over. So in other words, I didn't really find much in the realm of intention so far anyway. Um, so that got me thinking about outcome. So what is it the case that the, the, the outcome of the judgment in Stevens and Hutchinson can be accounted a, a feminist judgment because of 
uh, the, the outcome, let's just say, where Mrs Hutchinson was allowed to stay in the house, where her interests were uh, put before those of the creditors. She was the central beneficiary of that. Well, obviously, the trust, well, one of the beneficiaries of the trust for sale, but also the outcome of the judgment. Um, so I was starting to try and think about, uh, as Rosemary was explaining earlier on in her paper at the beginning of the conference, the background to the case in terms of uh, feminist literature. Uh, and so far, uh, and I think some of the points she made um, demonstrate this, that the that, that period wasn't, I'm talking the early 50s, late 40s, early 50s, although it didn't have such a pronounced um, set of um, lobbyists, uh, one might say. So it, instead I was thinking, well, perhaps the outcome is a bit like, again, Rosemary addressed this as well in her talk about um, sort of uh, the natural uh, outcome of, of the employment changes over, uh, over the course of the Second World War and beyond, having a beneficial uh, effect on, on the place of um, women in the workplace. I was, I was thinking about maybe the judgment in those terms, not least, as my second bullet point says on the outcome side of the slide, because of the operations of sections 14 and 35 of the LPA and Bull and Bull is good authority for this, where Denning, of course, outlines at page 238 that it's because of the position uh, of the individual as a tenant in common with that equitable interest that they get that outcome. And uh, obviously that can be applied to Mrs. Hutchinson as well. So perhaps there wasn't an intention to benefit in the way that I'm going to argue later, the legislature starts to think about um, uh, the home asset issue, but instead it's just the operation of what the legislature had in mind when they created section 30 of the LPA 1925. So that then took, takes me on to matrimonial home and purpose, which I've discussed briefly already in the previous slide. Uh, you know that the outcome of Stevens and Hutchinson is that she gets to stay, does Mrs Hutchinson, in the house uh, because the marriage is still extant. Again, we discussed this a bit earlier in, in Rosemary's earlier paper. Um, so he, he does, does Mr Hutchinson come and go from the property, but they're still married. Unlike Jones and Challenger, where in that case, you've got the husband who's staying and wants to stay in the house. The wife has committed adultery and then started a new marriage or you know, got married again. Uh, and three years or so has elapsed between those facts and the application for a, a sale under Section 30. And it's Devlin who focuses on the primary purpose of a trust for sale being obviously sale and the secondary or a secondary purpose being um, uh, the maintenance of a matrimonial home is obviously the the head or purpose that was still extant in Stevens and Hutchinson and can explain why the home wasn't sold and the creditors were, were placated in that case so again Jones and Challenge is interested on that point because obviously it's slightly later it's a higher level of authority coming out of the Court of Appeal um, uh, 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 and of course um, it therefore then supersedes discussion of Stevens and Hutchinson is a case on its own, perhaps, uh, and that might also account for why it's perhaps not as well discussed as it might be. Um, uh, and the, then the next bullet point takes me back to Bendel and McVerter, which I've already referred to. So I won't labour that point. Safe to say you could account that run of cases, the deserted wife's equity cases, as a separate judicial set of activity, whereas up John in this case perhaps is obviously exercising statutory discretion but in a different manner obviously to that which Denning was up to in his uh, uh, run of cases. In my original paper I was thinking oh is Upjohn some sort of uh, you know um, Denning-like character is trying to come up with solutions for the deserted wife um, but of course if we fast forward a bit later and again Rosemary actually said this in one of her comments into the 60s Later on, we know that in Ainsworth and Pettit, uh, Upjohn takes uh, you know, a completely different approach in the sense of, you know, it's for the legislature, in his view, in those cases, to resolve these issues when he and the rest of the House of Lords, um, well, deal with Denning. Um, so that that's how, as far as I've got so far in a kind of stakeholder genesis, uh, feminist lens approach. Um, 
but as I say, it's still a bit of a work in progress with that lens. Um, what I want to take you to now is the second part of the paper, but I've got a little bit of time because of my colleagues being indisposed. So I won't take a long time on this, but I just thought you might be interested as fellow uh, delvers in the archive. So when I was in the National Archive, I was looking at um, uh, up John's bench notebooks from the Court of Appeal, and these are some snapshots. So he wasn't mulling on the position of the wife uh, and any discretion he might have pursuant to section 30 in any of these notebooks, unfortunately. But what he was doing, as you can see, was doodling quite a lot. So uh, uh, we can account up John a doodler um, from those uh, uh, notebooks. Perhaps less uh, frivolously, there's this postcard that I thought was quite interesting. Uh, unfortunately, there's a, well, fortunately, there's some primary sources that uh, are in the Lord Chancellor's Department Archive section at National Archive, which have correspondence from up John kind of charting. We obviously know when he died. So as you're reading them, you you know, you know that there's, there's going to be this you know, terminal point coming up um, at some point, uh, 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 which obviously he didn't know at the time. Um, uh, so as you're reading this correspondence file, which is basically him giving excuses to the then Lord Chancellor why he can't sit as a Lord of Appeal in ordinary because of his hip replacement, basically. And you get this postcard coming in from his convalescence where he, he's abroad, of course. But then, as I say, there's this countdown where he then um, obviously passes away. Um, so that was there again, though, nothing on Section 30 in any of that correspondence file. Um, some interesting discussion, though in the broader file around um, the judicial qualities of Lord Denning um, in the view of Lord Haldane in 1937, um, which if anyone's interested, I can send you that separately. Um, basically summarizing him as a sort of maverick, but you know, the very sort of comments that we, we associate with him later on after that long judicial career. Finally, then there's just a bit of his handwriting for you to see as well. Right, back to the paper itself. So in the second part of the paper, I use this afterlives lens again, which is borrowed from Terence Cave and his work on English, well, sorry, French literature. Um, uh, and what he essentially does is use uh, or take a character in literature and then see how through posterity that character's been dealt with by either different playwrights or you know, different ways of um, dealing with that character, that fictitious character. I think it's quite a helpful way of either viewing legal um, uh, 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 personalities or, of course, cases like we're doing here. And the principal point, of course, uh, here in this paper is to try and use the afterlives lens to see how Stevens and Hutchinson, all the issues that it gives rise to, are dealt with in subsequent law reform or in... Um, the case law, and then ultimately statute. So that takes me to another important point in 1957, often neglected by insolvency scholars because of the much more famous Cork Report of 1982, Command Paper 8558. That's um, the, the one that everyone um, talks about, um, generally speaking. Although this one, the Blagden Committee, chaired by Basil Blagden, uh, much like the Cork report, no uh, female engagement, no, as in, that's to say, no uh, members of each committee, uh, none of the members of either committee were uh, women um, uh, or academics. There's no academics either um, on either committee. Uh, but this one's largely neglected as well, I'd argue. Um, uh, but it provides some useful insight. There's a slight problem in that the report's drafted in section order. So they've basically taken the 1914 Act and the 1928 Act and then just gone through them in sections. And obviously, if you're going to do that, you're not going to probably create new sections necessarily that might deal with things like the, the vexed question of the home as an asset or as a, uh, well, home. But, um, but there are some points of note. So first, in the introduction, there is a, a reference to change social conditions, but this isn't meted out Unfortunately, it could mean those employment changes that I referred to and Rosemary referred to earlier, of course, um, uh, um, but we aren't given much more. 
in their discussions of discharge, they do discuss, as you can see, the idea that the, the, the character of the bankruptcy is discussed in those early uh, comments I made about discharge applications. So that, again, might account for the, 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 the sort of near-do-well, waster, spendthrift language that we saw in Upjohn's Oberta comments in Stevens and Hutchinson. Perhaps more importantly, though, in terms of our stakeholders, under the discharge discussions, there is this mention, this is the second bullet point under discharge, of undischarged bankrupts, those that are languishing about the place, who have to go and get orders for discharge from the court, um, being a bit of a problem <laughs> in terms of after acquired property. So if that undischarged bankrupt gets some new asset value into their estate, that's available for the creditors, not for, as you can see here, those that might be the bankrupt's dependents. So at least we see some acknowledgement in paragraph 55 of Blagden of, of the idea that there can be these other broader stakeholders whose interests we should consider. Uh, and similarly, they come up again, and this is arguably for the first time um, uh, 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 in terms of a legislative provision that they draft, where we start to see caveats or carves out, carve outs from what is now the section 436 estate of the Insolvency Act 86. Um, uh, uh, and the carve outs are in section 283. That's to say things like necessary wearing apparel, bedding and furniture of himself, that's the bankrupt, his wife and children. So there's some discussion, but nothing about the house. The house remains as this property that obviously is uh, available to the creditors, um, well, at least a portion of it, uh, depending on its ownership. Um, that takes us forward a little bit in time. So we're telescoping out of Stevens and Hutchinson and the 50s then into more recent movements. In particular here, we're starting to think about the 70s and the sort of any ramifications or marks in posterity using the afterlives lens that um, uh, uh, we might see. Um, the first point to note, and it's the bottom right hand side of the slide there, you can see a screenshot of the court committee's report. So this is a report that's created throughout the 70s, chaired by Sir Kenneth Cork, staffed by people like Lord Millet, um, well, uh, Peter Millet QC as he then was, uh, and other barristers, a couple of solicitors and some accountants, as I say, no women or academics involved. Um, but in paragraph 198, of the Cork Report, uh, uh, where they set out the aims of a good modern insolvency law, some discussion of um, the uh, position of dependents, wives, uh, and others who are interested or could be affected by the bankruptcy. And obviously, uh, as we, we see in the title of this slide, those interests, and indeed uh, the, the home itself as a an asset to, and the ramifications of sale of that home start to be uh, included in specific pieces of legislation. But before I get to that, I just wanted to highlight two cases that are still under Section 30 of the LPA. Obviously, we haven't yet had the Tolata reforms that come in the 90s. Um, uh, so we get some bankruptcy cases like Stevens and Hutchinson under Section 30. That one there, Holiday, obviously pre-Cork, they reported in 1982, where you've got Lord Justice Goff, as he then was, permitting sale, so still a preference for creditor realisations, but at least with some sort of delay to allow the children to reach 16 and finish schooling. There is mention of Challenger, that Devlin authority I've referred to, and the earlier Buchanan authority of Lord Green, but no mention of Stevens and Hutchinson's, perhaps for the reason I argued earlier, that it's been superseded by Challenger in terms of the treatment of matrimonial home and purposes. Then we get uh, Citro in 91, so post the advent of the 86 Act and Section 335A, uh, where we've got Hoffman, uh, uh, Mr Justice Hoffman as he then was, postponing again for the interests of children, um, but uh, uh, I'd argue a retrograde step by the Court of Appeal when they reduce the period um, uh, and therefore keep the creditors out of their money for less time. So again, the dominance of creditors under the, the, the trust for sale uh, is something that we see. 
Shower Lombus is quite a, 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 an outlier, much like Stevens might be accounted, mainly because of the severity of the, the the wife's illness as a dependent who was living with a bankrupt husband, where, as you can see, Jonathan Parker uh, delays for a significant um, amount of time, namely indefinitely, until she's died um, or, or left the house for a care home. And there are the provisions of Section 335A, just for you to see to, to mull on the extent to which they may or may not be an echo of the kind of discretions that uh, Lord Upjohn was thinking about in Stevens and Hutchinson and section 30. In terms of the stakeholders, obviously we're starting to broaden out um, uh, those that are accounted within that discretion, not just um, uh, a, a, a broad and vague test of those interested as beneficiaries in the trust for sale, but an enunciation in the legislation of, of those kinds of dependents that Cork in paragraph 198 thought were those that we should be considering. Uh, and as you know, those kinds of themes that come out of the 86 Insolvency Act also form part of the big reforms where we, of course, lose the trust for sale as a structure uh, and replace it with the trust for land with the Talata reforms in 1996, where again, you start to see those broader stakeholders, or you do see rather, those broader stakeholders that we've been discussing. So um, I just thought I'd put a, a Talata case on there for you um, uh, and a, a bit of discussion from Newberger when he's thinking about older cases, much like those that I've briefly ran through. Um, although, of course, in that case, in Mortgage Corporation Share, he doesn't refer to Stevens and Hutchinson. So again, in my kind of afterlives, posterity lens, that, that's a nice bit about the older cases, but not so much in terms of the cases that they uh, include. OK, so to conclude, I'm slightly over time, but my fellow speakers aren't here. So hopefully you'll indulge me just on this last slide. Um, so to conclude on Stevens and Hutchinson, I'm still undecided as to whether it uh, uh, can be accounted a feminist judgment uh, in terms of outcome, or it's just the operation of the provisions that we've been discussing, um, or if instead it's some form of paternalism where we have Upjohn aghast at the activity of the bankrupt and uh, uh, and in those over to comments expressing that um, feeling uh, 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 as perhaps a signal to other men behaving badly, to coin a phrase from some of the scholarship on this area, um, uh, in future bankruptcies, um, uh, and also to creditors for perhaps irresponsible lending activity, uh, where we see you know, repeat lending to um, Mr Hutchinson. So that bit's still a bit moot, uh, uh, and I, I'm thinking that through still. I certainly still think, though, that Stevens and Hutchins can be accounted a, a, an important point in our consideration of that home asset debate prior to Talata and prior to Section 336A, sorry, 335A in the Insolvency Act, as a, a waypoint uh, a, a of consideration of broader stakeholder interests. Obviously, fact specifically in the case, it's the wife as a matrimonial home. Uh, beneficiary, but starting to take us down a road towards Blagden and then through to Cork and into the legislation uh, of thinking about those broader interests, uh, which then therefore means it certainly is aligned with the kind of scholarship that Rosemary, uh, Lord of Fox Mahoney, uh, have been writing for a long time now uh, around the home and its place within bankruptcy or division on um, her ownership breakdown. Um, so that's perhaps uh, a bit of a, a light being shed on the so-called forgotten case of Stevens and Hutchinson. Fox Mahoney does write about it, so it's not that forgotten. Um, perhaps it has been eclipsed a little bit by the Denning authorities um, as well. Um, but perhaps that brief talk has uh, brought it a bit more to light. Um, one final point, it would be very interesting for somebody like Sally Barber, the, one of the current bankruptcy court judges, insolvency and company court judge, to, to go over. She's very, very thorough um, erudite in her judgments. They're much longer than and thorough than the other bankruptcy registrars, as they were called. It'd be very interesting to see 
how she'd apply Section 335A to the facts of Stevens. I, I, if I was going to predict, I'd say that obviously they'd still be um, ultimately creditor realizations um, with all the negative effects that that would have on the home as a, as a thing. Okay, thanks very much for listening.